Hey everybody, welcome back to Historical-ish. This is the complete explanation video of the Ancient Mysteries Iceberg. In this video, I've compiled parts 1 through 12 and put them into a single video so that you can watch the entire series. If you've already seen all the other episodes, I just want to say thank you for watching. If you haven't seen all the episodes, this video is perfect for you. Welcome and enjoy the ride. Before we get started, I just want to say thanks to everybody for watching, and especially my patrons, Bean and Donald, who have been supporting me. If you're interested in becoming a patron, I'll leave a link down in the description below. It includes benefits like special Discord access to channels within the free Discord server. It also includes early access to all the videos at least a week before I publish them on YouTube. And also, one more thing before we get started, I apologize for the poor video quality in some of the earlier episodes. We were still trying to figure out how to use Premiere Pro, but if you watch the entire thing, you'll see the video quality does get better. So, I'll quit wasting your time and let you enjoy the movie. Tier 1. Well known. Number 1. Atlantis. So, Atlantis, as many of you may already know, is said to have been some ancient advanced civilization that collapsed and sank to the bottom of the ocean during some sort of cataclysm. And it is estimated that this happened roughly around 11,600 years ago. And the date obviously raises many questions with the coinciding of the Younger Dryas event, which there are also many theories behind that, in which the world's sea levels did see a sharp increase of around 400 feet. Randall Carlson and Graham Hancock do have a lot of theories on where Atlantis may be, what happened during the Younger Dryas, and we may touch on that later in a video, so we don't want to spend too much time on it now. But I will say what we do know about Atlantis is from Plato's work, which is a secondhand knowledge from Solon's work, which also happened to be secondhand knowledge from local Egyptian myths about a civilization, which are also said to have been historical records by the Egyptians. Plato writes that Atlantis was an empire and their capital, also called Atlantis, named after their king Atlas, was a ring city on an island said to have been west of the Pillars of Hercules, or the Strait of Gibraltar between Spain and Morocco. It has two rings of land and three rings of water. The civilization is said to have had advanced technology and culture, but they fell out of favor with the Greek gods, and the city was wiped away from the earth in a catastrophe. Like I said, there are many theories about what happened to Atlantis and where the location may be today. One of those examples is the Eye of Africa and also the Mid-Atlantic Ridge, and also the Olmec legend of Atlantico near the Yucatan in Mexico, but no major excavations have been done at any of the proposed locations, so we really have no idea. And all we have to find this mysterious lost ancient civilization is Plato's words and some map made by Herodotus in the 5th century BC. So there's no telling if we'll actually find the true location of Atlantis or whether actually it even existed or not. Number two is the Late Bronze Age Collapse. The Late Bronze Age collapse happened in 1177 BC, and during this time period there were a bunch of different powerful and advanced civilizations in the area of the Levant, Mesopotamia, and the Mediterranean in general. They were all interconnected through a vast network of trade. They mostly traded in specialized finished goods and metals such as gold, ivory, jewelry, trinkets, stuff similar to that. Some notable examples of these civilizations would be the Egyptians, Minoans, Babylonians, Hittites, and the Mycenaeans. And the decades following 1177, all these civilizations practically collapsed out of thin air, with some exceptions like Egypt. But the entire area was plunged into a period of dark ages, and languages and history were all lost, so we really don't know what happens. Um, for example, one of the languages that were lost was Linear A, and we'll touch on that a little bit later in this video. But one of the main reasons we don't know what happened in the late Bronze Age collapse is because of all this missing information due to the literal burning of these cities. Some of the reasons for the collapse range from one singular event to a wide range of events. The traditional theory is that it was caused by the invasion of these people called the Sea Peoples. And we don't really know who these Sea Peoples were. And this is actually number 10 on the list, so we'll talk about this later in the video so we won't get too much into it now. But a king in Canaan did describe these sea peoples as coming in and wreaking havoc within the kingdom. And there's actually a relief on the tomb of Ramses III that describes these battles. And luckily for the Egyptians, they had superior arms and were able to defeat and hold off these sea peoples. So they didn't completely collapse, but they did have a hit in their economy and their society in general. Throughout the region, there's archaeological evidence for entire cities being burned to the ground, completely wiped. 
and some also theorize that this is what caused the destruction of Troy, and we'll also touch on that later too. There's no true evidence of where these people came from, but scholars think that the Sea People's arrival was a result of famine, drought, and they were fleeing these external factors which caused them to move to the East Mediterranean and cause the actual collapse in the Late Bronze Age. But we'll never know for sure due to the lost languages and knowledge from these crumbling civilizations. Number three, the Oracle of Delphi. Delphi? Delphi? Let me look this up. How to pronounce Delphi. Delphi. All right, the Oracle of Delphi. This happened around 1400 BC, which is the Mycenaean Greece period. And it was said that this was the most important shrine in all of Greece. It was said to be built around a sacred spring and believed to be the center of the entire world. People came to have questions about their future, and all these questions were answered allegedly by Pythia, the priestess of the god Apollo, and pretty much the mediator between the humans and the Greek gods. Previously, the temple had an earlier dedication to Gaia, which was a previous ancient god and one of the Greek primordial deities, pretty much the first generation of the Greek gods, and said to be a personification of the earth. Subsequently, it was believed to be sacred to Poseidon, the god of earthquakes, and obviously the sea. During the Greek Dark Ages from about 11th to the 9th century BC, which, side note, is a notable time frame with ancient history, stuff like the Younger Dryas and other missing civilizations like Atlantis, but, I digress, the new god Apollo was said to have seized the temple and expelled the twin guardian serpents of Gaia, whose bodies he wrapped around the caduceus. I hope I said that right, but this is the modern day medical symbol. Caduceus. Caduceus. Haha, <laughs> I was right. Let's go. Cool. The Pythia would be sitting in a cauldron on a tripod, or stool, I guess, while making her prophecies in an in an ecstatic trance state, with her utterings practically unintelligible. This idea, however, has been challenged by scholars who argue that the ancient sources uniformly represent the Pythia speaking intelligibly and giving prof prophecies in her own voice. The tripod was perforated with holes, and as she inhaled the vapors, her figure would seem to enlarge, her hair stood on end, her complexion changed, and her heart panted. Her bosom swelled, and her voice became seemingly more than human. How creepy is that? And another interesting note is in the traditions associated with Apollo, the oracle only gave prophecies during the nine warmest months of the year, which, I mean, during winter months, Apollo was said to have deserted his temple. I mean, I don't blame him at all. Cicero noted no expeditions were undertaken, no colony sent out, and no affair of any distinguished individuals went on without the sanction of the oracle. That's pretty important. Delphi became a fantastic showcase of art treasures, and all Greek states would send rich gifts to keep the oracle on their side, and the temple became a religious and intellectual social meeting place, and not just in Greece, but all over the Aegean. They, I mean, literally everybody would come visit her. The most likely explanation for where the oracle of Delphi got her mystical abilities would be most of the time the oracle of Delphi was very accurate with her messages. And I don't think this is because she had some God-given power or anything like that. I just think that this is because she was well-informed by the leaders of other states. Enemies of other states would come to the Oracle for guidance in battle. And not like I said earlier, not just the Greeks. Everybody around the Mediterranean would come to the Oracle of Delphi for guidance. And I think she would catch on to that and kind of lead others on with that information. So it would seem like to others it was mystical knowledge when in fact it was just relative knowledge. An alternative theory based on review indicates that it is oleander that causes the symptoms similar to those of Pythia. The Pythia used it as a complement during the oracle procedure, chewing its leaf and inhaling its smoke. The toxic substances of the drug resulted in symptoms similar to those of epilepsy? <laughs> <laughs> or, quote, the sacred disease? That does not sound like a sacred disease. But anyway which amounted to the possession of the Pythias by the spirit of Apollo. So take drugs and become the Oracle of Delphi. Noted. But this gas that was admitted through the temple floor are the vapors of the Kerna spring water, which were attributed to her Oracle powers, but the exact gas is currently debated by scholars. 
And of course, both of these theories can be true at the same time. It's just interesting to think about. I also would like to say that it is interesting to note that the oracle does have connections to Christianity. When the Apostle Paul visited Philippi in 51 AD during his second missionary journey, he and Silas were followed by a young girl for many days who kept crying out to the people of Philippi, quote, these men are servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation, Acts 16, 17. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment, Acts 16, 18. The literal Greek word used to describe this woman is Pythia. She could have served in the temple of Apollo in Delphi, or she could have been a lesser oracle. What we do know is she had a spirit of divination. She followed Paul and Silas and spoke of them as being spokespersons of Zeus, the most high god, and said the people should listen to their words of deliverance in the same manner they listened to the words of the oracle. The Pythia was misrepresenting Paul and Silas. The Pythia's masters seized Paul and Silas and dragged them before their authorities and demanded the disciples of Christ be imprisoned. Paul and Silas were thrown in jail where they would later lead the jailer to the faith in Christ. Acts 16.31 also connected to the inspiration of the book of letters to the Philippians in the Bible, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Philippians to thank them because the Philippian church supported Paul when he was in prison. The oracle's use finally came to an end in the 4th century AD when the newly Christian Rome prescribed its prophesying. Okay, so this brings us to Stonehenge. And pretty sure everybody has heard of Stonehenge or at least learned a little bit of something about it. But I think this is pretty interesting, so we'll touch on it briefly. The mystery here is just how the stones got there, and there's a pretty funny legend about how and why they got there, but we'll touch on that in a minute. So the prehistoric monument in Wiltshire, England is dated to around 3100 BC, and the proposed use of the site as the culture that created it appears to not have left any written records about construction, use, or literally anything. It is said to be an astronomical observatory, a religious site, or both. Who knows? So researchers studying DNA found the bodies of those buried in the surrounding areas of the monument were of a Aegean ancestry, and it's estimated that they reached Britain around 4000 BC. So here's the interesting part. So according to Arthurian legend, you know, King Arthur, all that nonsense, and a tale from the 12th century book Historia Regum Britannae by Geoffrey of Monmouth, the stones of Stonehenge were healing stones, which giants had brought from Africa to Ireland. They had been raised by Mount Kilarus to form a stone circle known as the Giant's Ring or Giant's Round. In the 5th century, King Aurelius Ambrosius wished to build a great memorial to the British Celtic nobles slain by the Saxon at Salisbury. Merlin, yeah, Merlin the wizard, advised him to use the Giant's Ring. So the king sent Merlin, yes, the wizard, and Uther Pendragon, which was actually King Arthur's father, and 15,000 men to bring it from Ireland. They defeated an Irish army led by Glamanius, but were unable to move the huge stones. But Merlin, the wizard, helped. They transported the stones to Britain and re-erected them, and here they stand today. Mount Calaris may refer to the hill of Unsnich, and although this tale is fiction, archaeologists suggest it may hold a grain of truth. He thinks that evidence suggests the Stonehenge blue stones were brought from Juan Mon Stone Circle on the Irish seacoast of Wales. Number five, the Spear of Longinus. This is also known as the Holy Lance and is actually the spear that pierced Christ when he was on the cross. Originally, the Roman soldiers were planning on breaking his legs to speed up his death, but when they were going to bury the body, they found that Christ was already dead. So to be sure, they stabbed him in the side with the lance. And obviously, Longinus is the name of the Roman soldier who ended up stabbing him. And what happened to the lance after this happened is kind of a mystery. There's a relic that is described as the Holy Lance, which sits within the dome of the St. Peter's Basilica. Although the Catholic Church doesn't confirm its authenticity, so who's to say if this is actually accurate or not? But throughout history, the actual point of the lance had been rumored to be handed down among different kings and empires with the last thought of location, which I will say thought of because nobody knows for sure. The last thought of location to be the National Library in France, where during the French Revolution, that and other countless relics disappeared forever. So just like other religious relics, we honestly have no idea where any of these things are and if any of the claimed relics are actually legit. 
Number six, what was the star of Bethlehem? The story of the star of Bethlehem appears only in the book of Matthew, which is notable because you would think the other three gospel accounts would have mentioned this event in relation to the importance of the birth of Jesus. That's just me. Gospel tells that a bright star appeared in the eastern sky when Jesus was born, famously seen by a group of wise men. This should raise questions as celestial bodies don't just appear and disappear, but one explanation would have been witnessing a supernova, but the closest one recorded around the world was approximately 185 AD, so that doesn't quite match up. Another explanation that I've seen was that the star was a cluster of planets that happened to be grouped together or almost aligned, although perfect alignment is not possible given slightly different orbital planes. This is unlikely though because the closest estimate of the occurring is currently the year 44 BC, so we're getting closer but not quite there yet. But Jupiter and Venus, which are both the brightest planets relative to the Earth did align multiple times on approximately June 17th, 2 BC. The planets actually merged and weren't just close to each other on August 12th, 3 BC, the year before, which are around the historically accepted birth of Jesus, but that's for you to decide. I will say this explanation may be a little flawed because all of civilization at the time knew what the planets and constellations were, so if some of them mentioned something strange, but none of them knew it was a couple of planets merging, then what was the celestial body? According to Matthew, quote, when they heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them, till it came and stood over where the young child was. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy, end quote. This may illustrate irregular movements of the star, which would not be found in celestial bodies, but an explanation provided for that passage is that some comets that venture into the inner solar system can be seen for weeks or honestly even months at a time. And Chinese historical records support this as they labeled a comet a broom star around the year 5 BC. The irregular movements across the sky, however, suggest that the star of Bethlehem may not have been a celestial body or even like a comet, planet, or planets, or even a supernova. A supernatural explanation may be the closest to the gospel. It might be an angel directing the wise men to Jesus or even an extraterrestrial craft, but apparently we won't know what the true star of Bethlehem was until further historical documents accounts or revelations are found. Number seven, Zoroaster and Zoroastrianism. So Zoroaster was an ancient Iranian prophet who founded what is now known as Zoroastrianism. And Zoroaster himself is really the main mystery here because nobody really knows where he came from or when he lived. Some researchers theorize that he comes from the second millennium BC due to the proposed language he spoke, but others think he was alive during the seventh and sixth century BC, approximately the time of Darius I and Cyrus the Great. He's credited with writing the Gathas as well as the Yasna Haptangadi. Hope I pronounced that right. And eventually, Zoroastrianism actually became the official religion of ancient Persia. Zoroastrianism is actually one of the oldest known monotheistic religions and has many direct influences on Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. So the main mystery really here is who was Zoroaster and where did he come from? Number eight, the exact location of Jesus's tomb. So the most accepted location is believed to be in Jerusalem's Church of the Holy Sepulchre. So this location has experienced many earthquakes and destruction, but has been relatively kept up and maintained. But renovations and reconstructions have taken place. And I will note that this location is inside of Jerusalem's walls, which the New Testament states the tomb was outside of the city's walls, but the city's walls were noted to have expanded after his burial, so this location is kind of up in the air. Also, I would like to note that during restoration, it was found that a cross was engraved on a second marble slab that was under the previous slab, in which it was believed to have been carved in the time of the Crusades. And this slab dated back to the 4th century AD, and this is exactly the time that the Roman Emperor Constantine the Great built the church around the Holy Sepulchre, which was 336 AD. Now, there's a bunch of different theories on where this could have been, or where it's not, but some alternative locations include the Garden Tomb, the Talpiot Tomb, Rosa Ball, and Kirisuta no Haka. I would suggest looking a couple of these up because there's too many to tell, and honestly, it's kind of hard to find a tomb of a body where a resurrected body isn't anymore, so it's kind of up in the air. Number nine is Linear A. 
So Linear A was a writing system and language used by the Minoans of Crete from around 1800 to 1450 BC. It's found in Crete, the Aegean Islands, and the Greek mainland. It's presumably preceded by the Cretan hieroglyphic language, which was roughly 2100 to 1700 BC, and that itself was found in Crete and Samothrace, which is another Greek Aegean island. Linear A was then succeeded by, imagine this, Linear B from 1450 to 1200 BC, which has been identified as Mycenaean Greek or an early form of Greek, found in Crete, the Greek mainland, and a couple other places. Although Linear A has similarities to both its predecessor and successor, it is still undecipherable to this day. The only part of the script that we can read today with certainty are signs for the numbers, and we don't even know the words for the numbers. So it's pretty crazy we can read the predecessor and the successor, but not the one in the middle. I think that's pretty fascinating. And number 10, Sea Peoples. So obviously in number two, we touched on this briefly. I will note that the Sea Peoples, we have no idea where they came from or where they're going. So I think this is the perfect opportunity to dive into a couple of different theories about this because it gets pretty interesting. So the Sea Peoples are a purported seafaring confederation that attacked ancient Egypt and a bunch of other regions in the East Mediterranean prior to and during the late Bronze Age collapse, which like I said, between 1200 and 900 BCE. The origins of the Sea People are undocumented, and the Sea Peoples may have originated from a number of different locations, such as Western Asia Minor, the Aegean, Mediterranean Islands, and Southern Europe. Although the archaeological inscriptions do not include reference to a migration, the Sea Peoples are conjectured to have sailed around Eastern Mediterranean and invaded Anatolia, Syria, Phoenicia, Canaan, Cyprus, and Egypt toward the end of the Late Bronze Age. Egyptians referred to other people in the Mediterranean as land peoples, notably from Greece and the Levant. So it appears that the Sea Peoples may not have been from the Mediterranean, at least the eastern portion of the sea. According to the Egyptians, their confederation was the Peleset, Jekyll, Shekelesh, Dinan, and Washesh lands united. And honestly, I have no idea if I pronounce any of those correctly, but the Peleset and Jekyll are noted to be from Palestine and Syria, but the others are unknown to this day. The people of Washesh, as mentioned before, are unknown, but they were trading in the Baltic Sea, seas to the north as mentioned by the Egyptians about the Sea People, also trading in Mycenaean Greece, Anatolia, and the rest of the Mediterranean at the time, and could have even been the Wessex culture found in southern Britain starting around 2000 BC. If artifacts and descriptions of the Weshesh people have never been found, maybe we've been looking in the wrong place and they come from much farther north than previously thought. Maybe through language and artifact barriers, the Egyptians were trying to describe the Wessex culture, who were allied and trading with nations around Egypt at this time. This, however, isn't explained with the lack of British documents or artifacts of going to war in the Mediterranean at the time, at least to my knowledge. But it would explain how nobody could figure out who these people were. The leap of faith for this theory is that there is no proof. I just thought it was interesting and kind of cool how the names of Weshesh and Wessex can easily be mixed up with the language barrier, even more with languages that use different phonetic sounds, if you really think about it. Another growing theory that I recently heard, which might be a little bit of a stretch, deals with the tribe of Dan, son of the biblical Jacob. The tribe of Dan, literally meaning judge, was one of the 12 tribes of Israel, according to the Torah, and pretty much they were allocated a coastal portion of land when the people of Israel entered the promised land, later moving northwards. And this is supported by the city of Dan, which is Jerusalem's northernmost city. Some similarities here between the Egyptians noting the Dinian tribes being part of the coalition and the Dan tribe of the Israelites is the judge Samson. Both of them have similar stories. The Dinian people, like the Egyptians said, are said to have settled in southern Anatolia and on the island of Cyprus. They were known in the Hittite empire as the Dininium. The tribe of Dan's primary trade characteristic was seafaring, which is definitely unusual for Israelite tribes, and that does tie directly into the Dinian tribe which was within that coalition that the Egyptians talked about. In the Song of Deborah, the tribe is said to have stayed on their ships with their belongings, which is consistent with Egyptian records and descriptions of the Sea People, bringing their belongings and even women and children and seemingly trying to settle somewhere else. The tribe of Dan also joined the other northern Israelite tribes in making David, who was the king of Judah, king of a reunited kingdom of Israel, and that tribe actually provided substantial military support for the kingdom in the form of 28,600 soldiers being considered experts in war. If we assume that the tribe of Dan continued to move northward, since the Bible technically does not specify them stopping and settling in one location, even though there is a city of Dan, 
It could be theorized that the modern-day Danes in Northern Europe hail from the historical tribe of Dan. This would include all of Northeastern and Northwestern Europe as these areas assimilated. This is later called Nordic Israelism and also British Israelism, which unfortunately now is used for more anti-Semitic thoughts and actions, which also may play a role in the Wesh's theory earlier, but both of these alone are really loose, so it's probably highly unlikely that these are actually related or consistent, but who knows. I will note that there is a prophecy concerning Dan that is in Genesis. It's in 49, 16 through 18, and it states, Dan shall judge his people. As one of the tribes of Israel, Dan shall be a serpent in the way, a horned snake in the path that bites the horse's heels, so that his rider falls backwards. For your salvation I wait, O Lord. Within this verse, we are told that Dan's descendants would judge his people at some future time, which we don't really know when that is. The tribe of Dan, known for being experts in war, seafaring people, and bringing their belongings with them, including their wives and children, which is both attested to in Egyptian records and in the book of Judges. But prophecy of them coming back and judging their people, conquering and allying with the neighbors of Israel, before attempting to do the same to the Egyptians, seems to have come true if the tribe of Dan is in fact identified as the sea people. So I think the best way to summarize this entire theory is that that they moved so far north that they were unrecognizable to the people around the Mediterranean, only referring to them as sea peoples as they came on boats and nothing more because they had no idea where they came from. I know this is a little bit of a stretch. I thought it was an interesting theory to read about, but I hope that makes sense to y'all. There are a lot of similarities between the sea people and the Israelite tribe of Dan, but there are hundreds of theories out there about who the sea people were. So let me know in the comments below what you think or who you think the sea peoples are. I'm very intrigued. But obviously, think for yourselves. Number 11, the Nazca Lines. These are a collection of geoglyphs made in the dirt in southern Peru, and pretty much they're just trenches dug on the ground to resemble different animals and plants. Some of these animals include a hummingbird, fish, monkey, lizard, spider, and condor, and they're estimated to be created between 500 BC and 500 CE. There are two main types, uh, the first being the Paracas, which were made between around 400 to 200 BC, and then there's the Nazca between 200 BC and 500 CE, both of which were made by people removing stones and digging up the dirt to reveal a darker colored soil and the climate of the area being so dry and empty that these depressions are naturally preserved. The Nazca lines have a combined length of over 800 miles total, and most shapes are made using one continuous line. These things are massive, and it's pretty crazy because the best way to view them is from around 1,600 feet in the air, and this actually is the main mystery that deals with the Nazca Lines because you can't view them down on ground level. Some researchers believe that the Nazca Lines were designed as astronomical markers to show where different plants and stars would be at certain times of the year, while others simply believe they were designed to be seen by their gods from the sky. Some pretty crazy alternative theories range from rituals to summon water, or making irrigation schemes, to even ancient astronaut theory which states extraterrestrial use these lines as landing pads or guides for their spacecraft. Number 12, the Trojan War. So everyone is familiar with the story of Troy and the Trojan horse, and the mystery here is did the war actually happen and did the city actually exist? In the late 19th century, Heinrich Schliemann traveled to Turkey to find Troy as he had heard rumors of it being in the west coast of Anatolia at a site called Hasarlik. During his excavations, he found artifacts which are dated around the collapse of the Late Bronze Age, which we talked about in the previous video, so it very well could have been during that time period, as there was numerous sites of war during that time. Hasarlik was also found to be the location of around nine cities, all built upon the previous one, one of which very well could have been Troy. Some researchers agree that Troy was a real place, but due to the lack of information available, it is almost impossible to tell if it was real and if the Fable War actually occurred. Number 13, when was Jesus born? Most people believe that Jesus was born on December 25th in the year 1 AD, but most scholars agree that this wasn't on that day or in that year. The Roman Catholic Church picked December 25th to coincide with the winter solstice and Saturnalia, which was a festival for the Roman deity Saturn, making it easy to convert the population as well as other pagan religions in the area. The general theory is that Jesus was born between 6 BC and 4 BC based on the biblical story of King Herod trying to kill baby Jesus, which is closely followed by the death of King Herod himself. Although the date of King Herod's death is also disputed, most historians believe it was around 4 BC. And like I said in the first episode when talking about the Star of Bethlehem, the aligning of Venus and Jupiter in 2 BC, or the aligning of Saturn and Jupiter in 7 BC, could point to those years being the year of his birth. This is a highly contested topic with a wide range of theories, but I honestly doubt anyone will actually be able to know for sure the date of Jesus' birth. 
Number 14, where is the tomb of Alexander the Great? After the death of Alexander, the possession of his body became a hot topic between his generals because every single one of them wanted claim over his body. In 321 BC, the caravan containing his body was hijacked by one of his generals and rerouted to Egypt. His body was originally buried in Memphis and later moved to Alexandria where it became the focal point of the Ptolemaic cult of Alexander the Great. The last attestation that holds any merit whatsoever was in 1494 by Leo Africanus, who supposedly visited the tomb early in his life. Although over 140 official attempts have been made to locate the site, none of them have succeeded. And there are many different legends and theories on where his body is, ranging from Greece, Syria, and Venice, but most still point to Alexandria as the most likely place. Number 15, the Hanging Gardens of Babylon. So the Hanging Gardens of Babylon were one of the seven wonders of the ancient world, and they were described as a magnificent series of ascending tiered gardens. So pretty much imagine a tiered and terraced agriculture of the Incas, but just on a massive scale. The Hanging Gardens of Babylon had overhanging levels of numerous variety of trees, plants, and vines that all came together to form essentially a giant green mountain. According to one legend, the Hanging Gardens were built alongside a grand palace known as the Marvel of Mankind by Neo-Babylonian King Nebuchadnezzar II. He ruled between 605 and 562 BC. And this was made for his Median wife, Queen Amidas, because she missed the green hills and valleys of her homeland. The Hanging Gardens are actually the only only one of the seven wonders where the location has not yet been found. It's said to be along the Euphrates River, and there are also some theories that it's actually bordering the Tigris River. However, one researcher believes she has found the location of the gardens, but they are located in Nineveh, which is about 300 miles north of Babylon. She also claims that the site was constructed a century earlier in the Assyrian Empire by Sinkarnabur. She also claims that the site was constructed a century earlier in the Assyrian Empire by King Sennacherib. And there are numerous other accounts of a site that was wondrous and technologically advanced at the time. And technologically advanced at the time is just in reference to needing a complex irrigation system to keep the gardens alive. Nineveh was also renamed New Babylon when the Assyrians conquered the Babylonians in 689 BC after the king marveled and was inspired by Babylon's gates. There's actually some artwork of the gardens with a representation of a huge tower in the background, which is very similar to the Tower of Babel, also said to be in Babylon, but the time period of its destruction is a whole two millennia off when the gardens were built, or even first recorded in history. So this comparison and possible relation is highly doubted. Personally, I think the Assyrian theory seems to be the most plausible explanation for why we haven't discovered this ancient lost wonder yet. Number 16, the Moai. These are the famous human figures carved from a volcanic rock in Rapa Nui or Easter Island. They're carved between the years 1250 and 1500, and almost half of them still remain within the quarry where they were first carved. Just like a lot of other ancient mysteries, the question boils down to why and how. I would like to note that these things are massive. The tallest erected moai was 33 feet tall and the heaviest was 85 tons. One unfinished moai would have been around 70 feet tall and over 150 tons if it was actually completed. Many archaeologists believe these statues were used to hold the spirits of deceased ancestors as well as representing the status of the chief who commissioned it. In the 19th century, it was believed that the island was the remnant of a sunken continent which took the remaining moai with it, and many of you may have heard of this as the continent of Mew. Some oral history among the population tells a tale of people with divine powers such as kings or hermits commanding the statues to walk to their known locations now, but some widely accepted theories on how they got to their locations include being walked with ropes by tilting them to either side, as well as rolling them over logs. Either way, it would have taken a huge amount of manpower to get these to where they are, and that's one of the mysteries that remains today. Number 17, Sodom and Gomorrah. This is another biblical story, and Sodom and Gomorrah were two cities that were infested with sin and wickedness, as mentioned in the Bible. Genesis 19 shows the acts of the people that lived in the cities attempted on the angels or messengers sent from God to save Abraham's nephew Lot and his family from their destruction. The biblical narrative goes like this. God sent two angels to destroy Sodom. Lot welcomes them into his home, but all the men of the town surround the house and demand that he surrender the visitors so they may know them. It's kind of a funny way to uh, say commit adultery, but okay. Lot offers the mob his virgin daughters, that's not very nice, and says, do to them as you please. But they refuse and threaten to do worse to Lot. The angels strike the crowd blind. The angels tell Lot, the outcry against its people has become great before the Lord, and the Lord has sent us to destroy it. The next morning, because Lot had lingered, the angels took Lot, Lot's wife, and his two daughters by the hand and out of the city, and told them to flee to Zoar. Then God rained sulfur and fire on Sodom and Gomorrah and all the plain and all the inhabitants of the cities. Lot and his two daughters are saved, but his wife disregards the angel's warnings, looks back, 
and is turned into a pillar of salt. So there's a couple of things to unwrap here. First, the cities actually exist. Many scholars and archaeologists believe that the city Tal el Hammam underwent a catastrophe in the form of a cosmic air blast in the country of Jordan around 650 BC. This is pretty much just a meteor that explodes before reaching land. And they believe this city and the surrounding metropolis, as three other cities have been found in the region, was destroyed by a rapid wave of heat and wind. Because there is no impact crater around the site, scientists believe that a cosmic object exploded before reaching the ground and caused a blast that was a thousand times more powerful than the atomic bomb used at Hiroshima. For context, this would have put the flash temperatures around 3,600 degrees Fahrenheit and would have sent a shockwave traveling at 740 miles per hour. So the only thing that are left at this site is the foundation of the buildings, but no records or writings have ever been found. So the oral traditions brought down through the generations may have inspired the biblical story, or the biblical story was the original event and God essentially sent a nuke in the form of a meteor to wipe the metropolis out because of their sins. The last point that I want to mention, which is pretty interesting, the story of Lot's wife who turned around to look at the destruction, or in symbolical remembrance of living a sinful life and regretting leaving, was turned into a pillar of salt by God. Moses was also taken to this pillar when God was showing him the promised land to the 12 tribes of Israel coming to the end of their exodus from Egypt. Oddly enough, there seems to be a pillar of salt that dates back to the accepted time frame, and some biblical literists in all three Abrahamic religions believe this actually to be Lot's wife, turned into salt or stone and frozen dead in time. But obviously, there's a lot of difficulty trying to come up with a scientific explanation for any event like that. We may never know if there's any validity to the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and what happened to Lot's wife, but it's definitely cool to think about how real places and events that have taken place line up very well with the biblical narrative. Number 18, the Queen of Sheba. The Queen of Sheba was a biblical figure who visited King Solomon, but her actual existence is what's in question here. There's no mention in the Bible of who she was or where she came from, but some biblical scholars have made connections to Seba, the grandson of Ham's son Noah via Cush, which is in the land south of Egypt. But according to Arab and Islamic sources, the Queen of Sheba ruled over the land in what is now modern-day Yemen on the Arabian Peninsula, while Ethiopian records indicate she ruled over the Axumite Empire in modern-day Ethiopia. What's interesting about this is that both of these areas in the 10th century BC were both ruled over by the same empire, which is exactly the proposed time which she was supposed to be alive. Both cultures do claim to have the birthplace of the Queen of Sheba, and obviously this can't be true, so unless something else is uncovered, there isn't much more evidence pointing one way or another. Number 19, what knowledge may have been lost at the Library of Alexandria? This is one of my favorite topics to cover as there's no way of truly knowing the amount of information held within this library, some of which could probably answer some of the mysteries on this iceberg. It was commissioned in the early 2nd century BC by Ptolemy I and II and stood for nearly 300 years before it was destroyed. It claimed to hold all written knowledge in existence within its walls, with some of the ancient authors claiming it held around 700,000 different books. It was partially destroyed by Julius Caesar in 48 BC, but it had already begun to be in disuse for a while by this point. Although modern scholars believe that there were significantly less books than originally claimed by ancient authors, and that most of the books would have been copies in other locations, there's no telling what kind of knowledge was lost during its destruction. This lost knowledge quite possibly could have set back civilizations a couple of centuries. So there is a pretty wild theory that I've recently heard that connects the Library of Alexandria to the Vatican secret archives. So as everyone knows, the Vatican is in the middle of Rome, which was the capital of the time of the Roman Empire, when Julius set fire to the Library of Alexandria in 48 BC. And the Vatican secret archives, which have been secret to the public for the majority of its existence, only lets top researchers study texts that they already know exist. Nobody is allowed to browse through the archives, and you have to request stuff in order to study them, and there's a maximum of three texts or books a day that a researcher can study. There's around 53 miles of shelf space, and you can't go look through it all, and this is wild because there's so many ancient documents or even relics in there that being hidden, and nobody even knows that they exist. But the theory goes, what if Julius Caesar and the Roman Empire stole the documents from the Library of Alexandria, burned it to the ground as a cover-up for stealing the world's most ancient documents, and were keeping them and all of their secrets away from public eye. Notably though, Rome was not Christian at this time, obviously because this was in 48 BC, but could have Rome stored these texts away, and when the Vatican was established after the Roman Empire converted to Christianity, could these texts have been taken into the new archive and kept in secret for over a millennia? I'll let you decide for yourself, but I did think that was pretty interesting. And the last one for tier one, number 20, where was the Garden of Eden? The Garden of Eden is one of, if not the most, iconic story in the Bible. It's first mentioned in Genesis 2 and details the story of Adam and Eve. The only thing that's really said about the Garden is that it was in Eden, which was a land in the east, and that there are four rivers that watered the Garden. 
the Pishon, the Gion, Tigris, and the Euphrates. It also states where these rivers flowed to and what these areas were known for. Other than that, there's no real hints about where the garden was located. There are a couple of different theories or interpretations of these descriptions, and the first being that the location would be somewhere around the Tigris and Euphrates, since these rivers have remained relatively unchanged since ancient times. As for the two mysterious rivers, the Gion is said to be linked to the land of Kush, with its ties being the Dez and Karun rivers in Iran. And I will note that there are many different cities with the name of Kush in ancient times. The Pishon River is theorized to have dried up as there are satellite images of a dried riverbed that leads into western Arabia in which Havila is said to have been located with its abundant gold. All four of these rivers meet and are said to all empty together into the Persian Gulf, which some theorize the garden was located in. The other side says that during the biblical flood, or the Younger Dryas, whichever you prefer, made sea levels rise over 400 feet and drastically changed the geography of the area, meaning there's no real way of telling where the garden could have been since the geography is drastically different. If the Garden of Eden actually did exist, then both of these theories are possible, but I don't think we'll ever actually know. Tier 2, mostly well known. Number 1, Cambyses' Lost Army. So in 525 BC, Persian Emperor Cambyses II, who was son of Cyrus the Great, invaded Egypt and defeated Pharaoh Samstik III. Once defeated, Cambyses looked to the Oracle of Amun to solidify his rule, which they were unable to give him any legitimacy over the Kingdom of Egypt. So in retaliation in 524 BC, Cambyses then sent out an army of around 50,000 men to attack the temple which held the oracle, which is now in modern-day Siwa, Egypt. While Cambyses went south to Ethiopia to continue his campaign, the army of 50,000 men headed to the temple and within seven days apparently got caught in a massive sandstorm, which they proceeded to disappear within, never to be seen again. Herodotus writes, A wind arose from the south, strong and deadly, bringing with it vast columns of whirling sand, which entirely covered up the troops, and caused them to wholly disappear. I will note that this story is written by Herodotus, who is known to not be the most accurate of historians. He often embellishes or completely makes up parts of his works. So this wasn't even documented within the Egyptian or Persian records, so who knows if it actually even happened. There have been some expeditions to try to find the lost army with no real results to show for it. One claim in 2009 was proven to be a hoax, and one claim in 2011 wasn't authorized by the government and seems to lead to another hoax. Although it is likely to be a fictional story, some interesting theories include the army being picked off by mercenaries, getting lost in the desert, or even the story just being true, all of which would have caused Darius, the successor of Cambyses, to feel the need to erase this embarrassing story from their record. Number two, Etruscan civilization and its origin. So the Etruscan civilization was at its height from the 8th century BC to the 5th century BC and was located in the Etrurian region in Italy. To the Greeks, they were known as the Tyrrhenians, and due to their different languages, they had many questions about the origins of the Etruscans, which still haven't been answered today. Herodotus theorized that they came from Lydia in Asia Minor, fleeing from a famine at the time, but this theory is doubted due to the different language and cultural structures found in both civilizations, and also it was written by Herodotus. The three main modern theories are that they came from either Asia Minor during the Late Bronze Age, traveled over the Alps from the north, or evolved locally with significant influence from the east rather than the west. There have been some DNA studies to bodies that have been found, which notes that they have more DNA similarities to the peoples north of the Alps, which seems to be the most likely explanation for where they came from. Number three, helicopter hieroglyphs. This is actually a pretty interesting grouping of hieroglyphs found in Egypt with what looks to be a depiction of a helicopter, boat, submarine, and maybe even a UFO, depending on how you look at it. Obviously, this is way ahead of the time period in which these hieroglyphs would have been carved, which leads to some pretty crazy theories about Egyptians being visited by time travelers or even extraterrestrials. Although this is always fun to think about, it is highly unlikely that these theories hold any merit, with leading archaeologists believing that this is a common case of pareidolia, which is just when the brain perceives patterns or meetings when there really isn't any there. It is common in ancient Egypt for old or deteriorating hieroglyphs to be recarved or carved over, which could have led to what we see now as these mysterious markings. Some researchers believe that the original carvings were made under Seti I and then recarved under Ramses II, which is still long before helicopters even existed. I definitely think that the extraterrestrial theory is more fun and definitely goes along with the theme of the Egyptians gaining some mystical powers from some unknown beings. Number four, the plague of Athens. 
In Athens in 430 BC, an epidemic swept through the city and killed tens of thousands of people, which was nearly a third of its population at the time. But to this day, nobody knows the actual cause of this infamous plague. A year earlier, the Spartans and Athenians began a war between each other, with the Spartans making attacks on land while the Athenians focused mainly on naval warfare. One theory at the time was that the attacking Spartans poisoned the water sources, which caused the entire city to get sick, which was exacerbated by the fact that pretty much all Athenians in the region came within the city walls for protection against the Spartans and were in close proximity with one another. Another theory by Thucydides, who actually lived through the plague, states that it came up from Ethiopia, moved north through Egypt, and then finally reaching Greece. He describes the disease as starting with inflammation of the eyes and throat, moving to the lungs causing hoarseness and coughing, and finally the stomach which caused vomiting and violent spasms. He even describes people claiming to feel as if they were on fire from the inside with an unquenchable thirst. He also notes that most people would dunk themselves in water for extended periods of time to try to find some relief. He also notes that most victims did die within seven to nine days. This caused immense civil unrest in the region due to the amount of uncertainty about the disease as bodies piled up everywhere along the streets. According to Thucydides at the time, the Oracle of Delphi predicted the epidemic with the god Apollo aligning with Sparta and promising a victory over Athens. The plague ended five years later with around 75 to 100,000 people dead. The Spartans would go on to victory years later in 405 BC over the Athenians. A mass grave was found which dates back to the time period with DNA having a match to typhoid fever, but this is often refuted as the disease was common during the time. Some researchers believe it points to Ebola, but I'm sure we'll never actually know what disease it was in particular. Number 5. Shrunken Heads So everyone's pretty much seen the pictures of the shrunken heads that native tribes have, and there's a lot of mystery that has come out of Hollywood recently about these artifacts. These shrunken heads are more formally known as Sansas, and the most well-known come out of Peru and Ecuador, as the tribes in the areas had many different reasons for this practice. After a battle with another tribe, the victors would remove the skull, facial muscles, and the brains, and then sew the eyes and mouth shut, and then through a series of boiling the skin and filling it with hot stones from the inside, it allowed for the head to shrink to about a third of its original size. Once the skin dried, it would allow it to be preserved into what we have today. The reasons for this being that the enemies that were defeated, the victors believed that their spirits would be trapped within the head, and the victor could harness the spirit's power for themselves, showing the true victory over the enemy. Oddly enough, in the 1850s, Europeans had gotten this weird fascination with these shrunken heads, and the Amazonian locals began to produce these heads without any ceremonial value and strictly for trade. This hype around the shrunken head fascination caused a lot of forgeries and fakes to be made, usually using sloth heads, which I guess is better, but yeah. Number six, the Villa of Mysteries. This is a well-preserved Roman villa outside the town of Pompeii, and during the eruption of Mount Vesuvius in 79 AD, the villa along with the rest of the city was covered in a thick layer of ash that allowed for the preservation of the mysterious frescoes that are found on its walls. Originally constructed as a lavish villa, an earthquake in 62 AD caused it to fall into disrepair and began to be renovated into a more agriculture or winemaking villa, with actual winemaking presses being found within. Also within the villa, there is a statue of Livia, wife of Augustus, which does lead some archaeologists to believe that this was owned by her. Within one of the many rooms, there are a series of frescoes that is what the core of the mystery is here. The most common interpretation is the idea that they depict the initiation rites of a young girl into the mysterious cult of Dionysus, or as the Romans knew him, Bacchus. The frescoes are meant to be read as a single narrative, with some scholars believing the room itself was used to initiate women into the cult. This mystery cult was known to use different intoxicants to induce a trans-like state, in the goal to return to a more natural state. Obviously, since this was a mystery cult with only initiates knowing the practices, it began to fade away with the decline of Greco-Roman polytheism, and we don't know much more about it today. Number 7. Why do so many mythologies have flood myths? One of the greatest mysteries of the ancient world is that almost every religion on earth, past and present, has a flood story. This is an event where the entire world is essentially wiped out by a massive flood that is only survived by a small group of individuals with the task of repopulating the planet. Now these stories do vary from religion to religion, but the general principle is the same. 
The most common known flood story is in the Abrahamic religions, with Noah being commanded by God to build the ark, where then God sent down torrential rains that cover the earth. Only Noah and his family were saved, along with two of every animal on earth. In ancient Mesopotamia, the flood story is detailed in the Epic of Gilgamesh, where after the death of a friend, Gilgamesh, who goes to search for immortality, meets a man who is very similar to the character of Noah. He tells a tale of getting his relatives on a boat, as well as two of every living animal, and begin to repopulate the earth after the flood. Even the Aztec story bears some slight resemblance with the story of Noah, with a god commanding a couple to get in a canoe where they are sealed inside. They are told that they can only eat one ear of maize, but after the rest of humanity are turned into fish, they disobey their god and eat the fish. This does result them getting turned into dogs, which is a little bit different, but this forces humanity to restart from square one. The Greeks also had a flood story similar to Noah, except that instead of humans being saved by an ark, it was the gods, after which the gods threw stones down onto earth, which turned into humans and began to repopulate the earth. I could go into every culture that has a flood story, but there are hundreds. What's really interesting here is that across the whole earth, there is the story of the flood, which isn't to say that it's not true, but there has to be an underlying reason as to why each culture would write about such a specific thing. My favorite theory about this is one that I've talked about previously, which is the Younger Dryas Impact Hypothesis, which states that around 12,600 years ago, a comet hit Earth and caused a massive flooding event across the globe. Essentially, the comet hitting the Earth would have caused a huge heat blast that would have melted the North Atlantic glaciers immediately and caused sea levels to rise over 400 feet. Most cultures at the time did seem to reside near the coast, and would have caused an event in history across the globe that would have been seared into the collective memories of humans, but told in different flavors across the different cultures and regions. Number eight, the Phaistos disc. This was a disc discovered in 1908 from the Minoan palace of Phaistos. It's made from fired clay and is dated to the late Minoan Bronze Age in the second millennium BC. As you can see, it's covered on both sides with spiraled symbols and its purpose and location of origination is disputed. There are 45 distinct symbols within it, and it's almost impossible to decipher as these are the only times in which these symbols have been found. And since this is the only object with these symbols on it, no meaningful analysis can be done. Although two researchers believe the artifact to be a forgery, a later discovery of an axe with similar but not identical glyphs seem to point to the fact that it is authentic. There's a wide variety of theories about what it was used for, some being for prayers, a story, a board game, or even a geometric theorem but there's no way of proving any of these as they are all considered pseudo-archaeology. Because it has no resemblance to Linear A or Linear B, some scholars believe it is not of Minoan origin, but somewhere else in the Aegean, with claims that it has more similarities to Anatolian hieroglyphs. There is a vast list of different claims to have decoded it, but since it is a one-of-a-kind with no similar artifacts being found, it is almost impossible to say one of them is even close to correct. Number 9. Ever-Burning Lamps this is a pretty broad phenomenon that has been recorded throughout ancient history, although there have been no modern cases of ever-burning lamps today. As the name suggests, these are just lamps that burn for a significant amount of time longer than what they were supposed to, often for hundreds of years. These stories come from all around the world, from Asia, the Americas, but most specifically Greece, Italy, England, and France. Some notable examples of ever-burning lamps mostly include tombs, such as the Tomb of Pallas, which in 140 CE, the Tomb of Pallas was opened in Italy and was found to have a lamp within it that was still burning. It is claimed that neither blowing on or using water would extinguish the flames, with talks about some mysterious liquid within the lamp. Another notable tomb is the tomb of Constantius Chlorus, who died in 300 CE, but after King Henry VIII separated from the Catholic Church and ordered the destruction of Catholic churches and communities, this tomb was opened with a still burning lamp within. Now most all of the stories happen like this, so there's no need to dive into all of them, and since no modern examples have been found, most believe these stories to be fabrications. Although, some modern theorists do believe that these could be accounts of early forms of electricity, or even alchemy in which they created ever-burning liquids. Number 10, the Indus Script. Indus Script, or Harappan Script, is a collection of symbols, often very short, produced by the Indus Valley Civilization. The average length of symbols is 5, with the largest being 34 characters long, and there are over 4,000 inscribed objects with over 400 unique symbols, 
but still no way of reading a single bit of it. Some scholars have linked it to the Brahmi script found in South Asia or the Dravidian languages spoken in the southern tip of India. This is yet another undecipherable language due to there being no bilingual inscription to help decipher it, and since these inscriptions are so short, it is very difficult to tell if this is even a language at all, especially since the syntax and forms of it were largely unchanged over time. Number 11, Rome's secret name. Many historians today still debate over the original name of Rome, and even Cicero and Ennis talked about it 2,000 years ago. Some of the theories include it being named after the river Tiber, with its ancient name being Ruman or Rumin, or even a translation of Ruma, which means utter, coming from the legend of the wolf that fed the mythical founders Romulus and Remus. The first one who talked to us about the secret name of the city was Pliny. In his Naturalis Historia, he said, Mysterious rituals forbid to pronounce the other name of Rome. This does lead to other theories of Rome being more ancient than previously thought, with different peoples existing prior to what we know as Rome, which leads me to my next topic about Romulus and Remus. Could the myth be true, and did they actually exist? Number 12, the death of Romulus. In ancient sources, one can find several theories on the death of Rome's founder and first king Romulus. He is said to have died at the age of 55 after reigning for 37 years. The authors agree that he did not die of natural causes, but disagree on the actual events. The poet Ovid writes that Romulus didn't die of natural causes, but instead ascended into heaven to become a god himself, with his wife doing the exact same thing. Another author tells the tale of Romulus not punishing criminals for the assassination of Titus Tatius, and thus leading to an uprising that eventually got Romulus killed himself. While other authors write that Romulus was extremely strict in rule and often tyrannical at times, that the patricians ended up having an uprising and taking over power. Although these are pretty wild accounts of this mythical king, most historians agree that he was not a real person, but became a story for how the Roman people fought and conquered neighboring societies and became an eventual stronghold in the region. Number 13, where is Cleopatra's tomb? Cleopatra is maybe the most famous queen of Egypt, but she was also its last. Just like Alexander, her tomb has been lost for thousands of years and has yet to be located. She's known to have been the lover of both Julius Caesar as well as Mark Antony, and in 30 BC ended up killing herself after losing a war and being captured by Roman Emperor Octavian. According to ancient historians, this was done by using a venomous snake and was subsequently buried with her lover, Mark Antony, in a mausoleum outside the city of Alexandria. One of the most credible theories about where she is possibly buried is one that states that she is located within a site called Taposiris Magna, this site is located west of Alexandria and within the last couple of years has been undergoing excavation efforts by archaeologists. One of the main reasons this location could be the possible final resting place of Cleopatra is that during their excavations, archaeologists uncovered a massive amount of coins that were all minted during her reign. Another theory which is more widely accepted by archaeologists is that she was buried within the walls of Alexandria that are now underneath the Mediterranean Sea. For around 2,000 years, Alexandria has been succumbing to coastal erosion, which includes portion of Cleopatra's palace, which is currently under the sea. If her tomb was in fact located within her palace, then it would be destroyed by the sea and unable to be located. One last little note that's pretty interesting and also leaves more questions than answers is that Cleopatra was the last in line of Ptolemy rulers who descended from Ptolemy Soter, a general of Alexander the Great. And funny enough, we don't know the location of Alexander the Great's tomb or any of the 15 Ptolemy rulers that ruled between the death of Alexander and the death of Cleopatra. Number 14, Missing Poems from the Epic Cycle. Two poems that everyone knows are the Iliad and the Odyssey, but what some people don't know is that there were many other epics written during the time that also detail the famous events of the Trojan War and the death of Achilles, which if found could lead us to find the truth about this fabled war. Just like the surviving epics, these were also composed in dactylic hexameter, and there were even surviving fragments of summaries of these works, such as Crestomathy by Proclus, and even some of the works by Euripides. The five missing epics are the Cypria, the Athiopis, the Little Iliad, the Sack of Ilium, and the Return of Telegoni. All of these are separated into different books within, and all detail different stages of this war, all the way from pre-war preparations and the events which led up to the war, to the death of Ajax, Achilles, and even Odysseus. Although it is highly unlikely we will ever find the full-length epics, if we did, it could point us towards the truth about Troy, 
whether the city actually existed, and if the war actually happened. Number 15, the Dead Sea Scrolls. So in 1947, on the West Bank, one of the most important discoveries was made, which led to a deeper understanding of the Bible and the histories of Judaism and Christianity as a whole. The Dead Sea Scrolls were uncovered by a young child throwing stones into caves, where he then heard a crash of shattered pottery. Within these were over 800 documents made from animal skin, papyrus, and even forged copper. Within these documents are parts of every book within the Old Testament, except for the book of Esther, and there are even previously unknown hymns, prayers, and early versions of the Ten Commandments. Most of these were written between 200 BC and about 70 AD, which precedes the previously oldest known Hebrew text that has ever been found. The mystery here deals not with the authenticity of the text, but with who actually wrote them. In 164 BC, the Maccabees overthrew the Seleucid Empire that ruled over Judea, and these texts show the viewpoint of one of the many sects that were vying for power during the time. This means it does not show a universal understanding of the time period, but just one slice of a complex power struggle that was going on. Due to this complex power struggle at the time, there are two main schools of thoughts about why these texts originated. The first being that these were a way of preserving early Christian rites and rituals, with theories stating that this was a monastery that even John the Baptist studied at, with the second school of thought being a way to preserve written knowledge before the inevitable conquest by the Romans after the Jewish revolt. Although these texts are mysterious in that we don't know who or why they were written, it does open our eyes to what Jews and Christians at the time would have thought and even practiced. Number 16, Gobekli Tepe. This is an archaeological site in Turkey uncovered by Klaus Schmidt 25 years ago. And what makes this site in particular so remarkable is that it is believed to have been constructed at least 11,000 years ago, which raises many questions about the people who built it. Within the site, which is still being uncovered today, there are around 20 circular stone enclosures with stone pillars weighing more than 10 tons that are meticulously engraved with detailed art. What's weird about that is that 11,000 years ago, it is believed to be a time where humans hadn't domesticated animals, used metal tools, or even invented pottery, making it very difficult for humans to build such a complex structure. This in itself shows the importance of such a site as the people who constructed it would have had to put in an untold amount of man hours to carve and construct this massive stone structure. Within the site, there is evidence of wild animal bones, but no evidence of domesticated animals or grains showing that it was most likely hunter-gatherers that built this site, with most scholars believing it was made for a religious purpose rather than a shelter, but could have been a cause for the hunter-gatherers to settle down and start farming so they could be closer to their religious center. Some fringe archaeologists believe that this site shows possibility of advanced civilizations existing prior to the Younger Dryas event. This would give an explanation to the possibility of places like Atlantis, as well as even older unknown civilizations during this time. People within this school of thought believe that humanity has been around for a lot longer than previously theorized, and that there have been numerous civilizations that have risen and fallen, but have been lost to time. This is definitely one of my favorite theories about the ancient world, because it opens up so many doors for different civilizations and events that we have never heard of, and probably never will. Number 17, the Indus Valley Civilization. Now this ties into the Indus script, which I talked about in my previous video, but this is actually the mystery behind the advanced civilization that wrote this script in 2500 BC. Mohenjo-Daro is one of the biggest settlements found in the Indus Valley civilization and is known for having complex city planning with streets, wells, trash disposal, and even drainage systems, which to note was well before its time. I won't get into too much of it since I detailed a bit of it in the last video, but since we can't read their mysterious script, it's hard to tell who these people were or what they believed and all we really have to go off of is the advanced structures found in Mohenjo-Daro. Number 18, Sappho's Lost Poems. Sappho is an ancient Greek poet from the island of Lesbos who lived possibly around 625 to 570 BC and who we know very little about. After her death, a nine volume edition of all of her works was compiled and published, but today we only have around 700 fragmented lines in total. It is theorized that due to Christian censorship, her work was repressed for being too sexual with implied homosexuality found within it. And although this is true, almost all the poetry during the time contained these elements because it was the norm in ancient Greece, and yet none of these poems were censored by the church. 
These were actually preserved, so this theory holds little validity. What's more likely is that since these works were lyric rather than epic, when historians of the time began to copy down works on papyrus, the lyrical style would have not been on the top of their list, with scholars focusing much more on works from Plato and Aristotle and the likes. Also due to her rare dialect, not many people would have been able to understand her anywhere other than her island, so her works weren't widely as accepted during the time period. Number 19, the mystery of the elongated skulls. Throughout history, there are many different instances of tribes who practice elongating their skulls for ritual purposes. This was done by taking a newborn baby whose skull was still developing and tightly binding it to force the skull upward to create the oval-shaped skull like you see here. Once the skull was fully formed, it would be permanent for the entire life of these people. This ritual is quite old with evidence of it occurring thousands of years ago, with it still being continued today in remote areas of the Pacific Islands such as Vanuatu. They have been found all over the world in disconnected areas such as Africa, Germany, North America, Australia, and even the Caribbean Islands. Some researchers believe this was done to show royalty or status within a culture, or even to differentiate themselves from neighboring societies. Other theories for doing so include spiritual, with it meaning you were closer to the gods, or even that it enhanced a person's intellect or mental capabilities. One interesting event that occurred happened in 1928, when an archaeologist in Paracas, Peru, found a cemetery with elongated skulls. And after claiming to run DNA tests, says they were not of any animal or human origins, leading many alien theorists to believe that these were the body of aliens and that the goal of the elongated skulls around the world was to please the alien visitors. Many scholars assume that these DNA tests were falsified as a goal to try to boost tourism in the area, which probably was a pretty good idea, but why does everything always just lead back to aliens? And number 20, where is the Ark of the Covenant? In Jewish and Christian tradition, the Ark represents a physical manifestation of God with claims that if touched, you would die instantly kind of like the Nazis in Indiana Jones. Allegedly, it was carried into battle where they were able to easily defeat empires with it until it was finally kept within the Temple of Jerusalem where only the high priest could visit it. In the 6th century BC, Babylon sacked Jerusalem and that was the last known location of the Ark, with it disappearing forever after that. The most well-known theory about the Ark deals with the Queen of Sheba, who had a son with King Solomon, and when leaving the kingdom to return to Ethiopia, Menelik, Queen Sheba's son, took the Ark with him back to Ethiopia, where it still remains today. This is actually pretty interesting, considering there are a number of other religious sites within Ethiopia today that claim to have the Ark, but will not let anyone inside to see it. Only the high priest is allowed to view it, keeping the tradition of ancient Jerusalem. Most scholars do agree that if it did exist, then it probably disintegrated over time or was even destroyed and doesn't actually exist within Ethiopia or anywhere in the world anymore. Tier 3. Lesser known about. Number 1. Ancient automatons. The word automation or automaton comes from Greek, with Homer being the first to use this term. He describes these machines as self-moving objects, more specifically referring to godly objects used in Olympus. Although at first was used to describe magical objects, the Greeks eventually were able to design and build automatons, usually used as toys or other forms of entertainment. One notable example being bronze animals on display at the Olympic Games. The famous Greek mathematician, Hero of Alexandria, devised a water basin that featured metal birds which sang. A mechanical owl would turn its head to look at the birds, making them go quiet. One of his most well-known creations was a wind wheel. This is possibly the earliest example of man harnessing the power of wind in a non-sea environment. Mythical stories during this time, and not just from Greece. In Jewish legend, King Solomon created a throne whereby a mechanism was put into motion when he stood upon it. Mechanical animals such as lions and tigers helped him up each step by way of a wheel making their paws move to support him. At the top of the step, Solomon's crown would be delivered by an eagle and then he was seated upon the throne. More wheels would cause each animal to deliver its respective cry as a means of striking terror into those who stood before the king. Lastly, a dove would bring King Solomon a Torah scroll containing the laws of God. During the Hellenistic period, these automatons advanced greatly, with these devices using levers and pulleys to build self-moving machines. The Isle of Rhodes is most notable for having automatons in its city square to impress visitors. The majority of technology developed by the Greeks seems to have been only for entertainment, spectacle, and toys. 
However, the Antikythera mechanism, which was around the 1st century BC, recovered from a sunken ship in the Aegean Sea, appears to be the first analog computer. It was designed to make astronomical calculations possible in order to determine the timing of the Olympics. With many different stories around automatons being present throughout the ancient world, a good portion of them seem to hold technology way before its time. This begs the question of if some of these automatons were real, or in fact just stories told by ancient writers. Number 2. The Gundestrup Cauldron Around 2,000 years ago, someone near the town of Gundestrup, Denmark, buried a stack of silver panels within a silver bowl. Each panel has detailed artwork related to Celtic mythology and religion, showing animals, heroes, and gods. In 1891, a peat collector working in the bogs uncovered the panels, and after study by archaeologists, they realized the plates could be attached to the bowl to form what we know as the Gunderstrip Cauldron. What's most interesting about the cauldron is that initially it was thought to be strictly a Celtic piece, but after further examination, it shows that it in fact was a combination of many different cultural influences around the ancient world. The history of the Gundestrup cauldron dates back to between 150 BC and the birth of Christ. Today, most experts believe that the Celtic cauldron was forged in the Balkans with Thracian metalworking. But clearly, someone who was possibly of Celtic origin and well-versed in Celtic religion took great care to ensure that many significant religious icons were displayed on the vessel. What we don't know is what the cauldron was used for as well as why it was so carefully buried inside the peat bog. During the Celtic Iron Age, it was not uncommon for sacrifices to be made to the bogs, as the people believed that the bogs were the home of the gods due to the necessary resources found within the bogs. One leading theory about the cauldron is that it was buried alongside the owner once he had passed away in order to accompany him into the afterlife. Other than that, not much is really known about the Gundestrip cauldron, which is why we find it on Tier 3 of the Ancient Mysteries Iceberg. Number 3, The Long Man of Wilmington. The Long Man of Wilmington, or the Wilmington Giant, is a hill figure on the steep slopes of Windover Hill near Wilmington, England. It was originally believed by archaeologists to be from around the Iron Age until a study in 2003 dated it to roughly the 16th or 17th century AD. It is a figure of a man holding two long rods or staves and is drawn so that when viewed from the base of the hill, it seems like a proportional image. Theories of its origin include marking the location of Orion's constellation in the sky, directly above the hill, and as a tribute to Odin. The two main functioning theories as of today are 1. An artistic monk from the priory nearby made it, or 2. Was made in protest of the persecution of Protestant martyrs by local villagers in the 1550s. Funny enough, it was painted green during World War II, so as not to be used by German pilots as a landmark for navigation. Other than that, I think the Long Man of Wilmington has been debunked as an ancient mystery, but still raises some questions about who made it and why they made it. Number 4. Darius the Mede Darius the Mede is mentioned in the book of Daniel as king of Babylon between Belshazzar and Cyrus the Great. But he is not known to history and no additional king can be placed between the known figures of Belshazzar and Cyrus. Most scholars view him as literary fiction, but some have tried to harmonize the book of Daniel with history by identifying him with various known figures, notably Cyrus or Gobryas, the general who was first to enter Babylon when it fell to the Persians in 539 BC. Darius is mentioned a couple times in the book of Daniel, in Daniel 5, Daniel 6, and Daniel 9, but the book of Daniel is not regarded by scholars as a reliable guide to history. The broad consensus is that Daniel is not a historical figure, with the author appearing to have taken the name from a legendary figure of a distant past mentioned in the book of Ezekiel. While it is a book featuring prophecies, the book that bears Daniel's name is an apocalypse, not a book of prophecy, and its contents are a cryptic allusion to the persecution of the Jews by the Greek king Antiochus IV. There is broad agreement that the stories making up chapters 1 through 6 are legendary in character, and that the visions of chapters 7 through 12 were added during the persecution of Antiochus, and the book itself being completed soon after in 164 BC. Daniel 5 and Daniel 6 belong to the folktales making up the first half of the book. The language of Daniel 5, for example, follows ancient Near Eastern conventions, which are in some cases precisely those used in Daniel. Daniel 6 is based on a classical Babylonian folktale in the telling of a courtier who suffers disgrace at the hands of evil enemies, but is eventually restored due to the intervention of a kindly god. In the story in Daniel, this is the God of Israel. In the Babylonian original, the Pit of Lions is a metaphor for human adversaries in court, 
but the biblical tale, he turns the metaphorical lions into real animals. In Daniel 9, Daniel, pondering the meaning of Jeremiah's prophecy that Jerusalem would remain desolate for 70 years, is told by the angel Gabriel that the 70 years should be taken to mean 70 weeks, literally sevens of years. Verse 1 sets the time of Daniel's vision as the first year of Darius' son, Ahasuerus, by birth a Mede. But no Darius is known to history, nor can any king of Babylon be placed between the genuine historical figures of Belshazzar and Cyrus. So did Darius actually exist, or is this just a combination of Babylonian folktales passed down through the generations and eventually compiled into the book of Daniel? Number 5. Rongo 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 is a system of glyphs discovered in the 19th century on Easter Island that appear to be writing or proto-writing. Numerous attempts at decipherment have been made, with none being successful. Although some calendrical and what might prove to be genealogical information has been identified, none of these glyphs can actually be read. If Rongo Rongo does prove to be writing and proves to be an independent invention, it would be one of the very few independent inventions of writing in human history. Two dozen wooden objects bearing Rongo Rongo inscriptions, some heavily weathered, burned, or otherwise damaged, were collected in the late 19th century and are now scattered in museums and private collections. None actually remain on Easter Island, and the objects are mostly tablets shaped from irregular pieces of wood. Sometimes driftwood, but includes a chieftain's staff, a birdman statuette, and two Riemero ornaments. There are also a few petroglyphs, which may include short Rongo Rongo inscriptions, but oral history suggests that only a small elite was ever literate and that the tablets were sacred. Interestingly enough, in 1932, Wilhelm de Hevesi suggested a link between the Rongo Rongo script of Easter Island and the Indus script of the Indus Valley civilization, claiming that as many as 40 Rongo Rongo symbols had a correlating symbol in the Indus script. For a while, the idea was entertained and debated until radiocarbon dating of the Indus Valley civilization was placed between circa 3300 and 1900 BC, a finding that officially separated the two cultures by over 2000 years. Recent research, however, has opened the debate again as the finding of Indus Valley DNA in Australian Aborigines suggests a contact between the two cultures in 2000 BC. And these are in fact the peoples that did eventually colonize Easter Island, so it would be really interesting to see if that actual connection between the Indus Valley script and Rongo Rongo has held up over that length of time. Number six, the Black Sea Flood. The Aegean Sea and Black Sea used to be separated by a raised ridge called the Bosphorus, which kept salty seawater out of the Black Sea, or I guess what used to be a freshwater lake. But at the end of the last ice age, when sea levels were raised due to the ice sheets melting at an increased rate, Water from the Mediterranean rose above this ridge, connecting the two seas. A controversial theory proposed in 1997 states the water surged with a force of over 200 Niagara Falls, which could have wiped out early human settlements on the banks of the lake and inspired the stories of Noah's Ark, the Epic of Gilgamesh, and other catastrophic flood myths within the region. Underwater archaeologists have in fact found evidence of an ancient shoreline 400 feet below the current sea level by carbon dating shells in the area. This would support the hypothesis that a catastrophic flood wiped out almost 20,000 square miles around the lake. Although it's likely that this flood wasn't as devastating as it's made out to be in flood myths like Noah's Ark and the Epic of Gilgamesh, I think it would have a vast impact on the humans around that region and would have been seared into the collective memory. Number 7. Vinca Symbols Vinca symbols are yet another form of an undecipherable language found in Central and Southeastern Europe on Neolithic era artifacts. There is a lot of dispute about whether these are an early form of writing or simply symbols used for design, with many scholars describing these as pre-writing or proto-writing. The earliest discovery of these objects was in 1875 when a cache of objects was uncovered with previously unknown symbols, which raised a lot of debate about when these items originated from. Tablets found in 1961 revived the debate when radiocarbon dating placed them before 4000 BC which predates the writing systems of the Sumerians and the Minoans. Many different theories have emerged from these symbols due to how short the inscriptions are and how simple the markings can be. Leading theories are property marks, numerical signs, religious symbols, or as stated before, an early form of writing. Number eight, ancient Greek zombies. In the 1980s, over 3,000 graves were discovered in an ancient Greek necropolis in Sicily. What's interesting about this is that two of these graves were pinned down within due to the supposed belief that these two bodies had the ability to reanimate 
leave their graves, and harm the living. Ancient Greeks believed these to be what we call zombies, and to make sure they didn't raise from the dead, they would dismember the bodies or pin them down within their graves by tying them down, flipping them upside down, or placing heavy objects over their stomachs, head, or feet. Nobody really knows why these two bodies in particular were singled out as zombies, but theories include they were outsiders, illegitimate children, victims of murder, plague, or curses. There are many different examples of this being practiced around ancient Greece, and there's no real evidence of whether the Greeks actually believed these to be zombies, or if this was simply just a funerary superstition that they practiced throughout ancient Greece. Number 9. Hermes Trismegistus Hermes Trismegistus is a legendary Hellenistic figure that originated as a syncretic combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth. He is the purported author of Hermetica, a widely diverse series of ancient and medieval pseudopigraphical texts that lay the basis for various philosophical systems known as Hermeticism. During the Middle Ages and the Renaissance, the Hermetica enjoyed great prestige and were popular among alchemists. Hermes was also strongly associated with astrology, for example, by the influential Islamic astrologer Abu Mashar al-Baqi. The Hermetic tradition consequently refers to alchemy, magic, astrology, and related subjects. The texts are usually divided into two categories, the philosophical and the technical Hermetica. The former deals mainly with philosophy and the latter with practical magic, potions, and alchemy. During the Renaissance, it was accepted that Hermes Trismegistus was a contemporary of Moses. However, after Isaac Casabon's demonstration in 1614, that the Hermetic writings must postdate the advent of Christianity. The whole of Renaissance Hermeticism therefore collapsed. There is evidence of this individual being identified in many different religions around the ancient world, but since this can be traced to a combination of the Greek god Hermes and the Egyptian god Thoth, it is highly unlikely that this figure was actually a real person. Number 10. Mithras and Mithraism Mithraism was an underground Roman religious group that worshipped a pagan deity called Mithras. Although it was a covert religion, it once was so widespread it is theorized to be an early rival to Christianity. The belief system and cosmology of Mithraism has stumped historians for thousands of years, and the members of the religion have not left any written documents of their beliefs. One theory holds that the cult's central iconography is a star map. The bull Mithras kills in the Tauroctony is actually the zodiac Taurus. By slaying Taurus, the god is therefore responsible for shifting the procession of the equinoxes. This cosmic movement was secret knowledge shared among indoctrinated members of the ancient cult during a time when the universe was still seen as a stagnant entity. Ancient Romans believed Mithras was based on a Persian god, though most scholars have since debunked this theory. Other than the iconography on the walls of their places of worship, we know next to nothing about their belief system of these people. What is known for certain is that Mithraism arose sometime during the first century and then continued to spread throughout the empire until it eventually disbanded toward the end of the fourth century. They believed the epicenter to be Rome, and with it being so popular among the soldiers, temples have been found as far as England and Turkey. According to a poem written by an ancient Roman poet, initiates were called syndoxi, which loosely translates from Latin, meaning that they had been united by a handshake. Meetings were literally underground operations, with members gathering in the dark, subterranean temples, and sometimes built inside caves to feast and worship within the windowless walls adorned with religious artwork. But other than that, not much is known about this mystery cult. Number 11. Plautonian at Hierapolis Also known as Pluto's Gate, this was where a Plautonian, or a religious site, dedicated to the god Pluto was. It is located within the ancient city of Hierapolis near Pamukkale in modern-day Turkey. The site was discovered in 1965 by archaeologists who have noted that both the Plutonian and the nearby Apollo's Oracle of Hierapolis were built atop the remains of a seismic fault that were thought to be the gateway of Hades. Though the exact dating of the site is unknown, we do know that the city itself was founded around the year 190 BC and used continuously until finally being destroyed in the 6th century AD by earthquakes. As mentioned before and similar to the Oracle of Delphi, the site sits on top of a cave that emits toxic gases, which is why it was used as a ritual passage to the underworld. People believe that the gases from the cave were released by Pluto, god of the underworld, as anything that was nearby would end up dying. 
The priests of the area would hold their breaths and descend into the cave and find small pockets of oxygen within that would allow them to make the citizens believe that they were in fact immune and solidify themselves with their divine protections. The ancient historian Strabo described the gate as follows. Any animal that passes inside meets instant death. I threw in sparrows and they immediately breathed their last and fell. The priests sold birds and other animals to the visitors so that they could try out how deadly this enclosed area was. Visitors could obviously, for a fee, ask questions of the Oracle of Pluto. At the time, this was a mystery of where these gases came from, as many believed that it was from the gods. But today we realize that these gases just came from geothermal activity in the area, so not much more explanation is needed. Number 12, the Antikyther Mechanism. This is something I touched on briefly in an earlier video, but wanted to dive deeper into here. The Antikyther mechanism is the oldest example of an analog computer, and was used to predict astronomical positions and eclipses decades in advance, as well as track the four-year cycle of the Olympic Games. Using different scanning techniques, archaeologists were able to see that there were 37 bronze gears within that allow it to follow the movement of the moon and the sun through the zodiac to predict eclipses and model the irregular orbit of the moon. This irregular motion of the moon was actually studied by Hipparchus of Rhodes in the 2nd century BC, and speculation points to him using the machine as a basis for his studies. Further theories suggest that there is a significant portion of the device missing that was used to calculate the position of the five classical planets. Dating of the device is as old as 205 BC, and what's wild about that is that machines with similar complexity did not appear again until the astronomical clocks of Richard of Wallingford and Giovanni de Dundee in the 14th century. Due to this, many outlandish theories have emerged ranging from the existence of time travel, the Anunnaki leaving it, it coming from Atlantis, evidence of intelligent design, you name it and there's probably an Antikythera mechanism theory attached to it. Number 13, the lost mine of Ophir. King Solomon ruled on or around 970 BC and is one of the most recognizable characters from the Old Testament. He was known for many different things during his four-decade rule, but one thing he was most known for was his wealth, which is claimed to have originated from the mine of Ophir. Allegedly, King Solomon had so much gold that by today's standards would have been worth roughly $60 trillion, but nobody knows for certain where he got this absurd amount of gold because the Bible does not go on into specifics about where the mine was located. Scholars believe Solomon worked closely with another regent, Phoenician King Hiram, and since the Phoenicians were great sailors with outposts all over the Mediterranean, it is almost impossible to pinpoint the location of this mine. Some notable theories about the location of this mine include Africa, being the gold mines in Zimbabwe, Ethiopia, or Tunisia, although there have been zero evidence dating anything to the time of Solomon. There's also some theories about it being in Asia from the Dravidians in southern India, and due to some similar root words and common names for rivers, it is often tied to this as well. There are even some weirder theories that suggest it was located in the Americas, which, as you can already tell, is pretty far-fetched. Archaeologists have claimed on multiple different occasions to have found the mine, but it's almost impossible to know for certain if these are the actual mine used by Solomon to create his legendary fortune. Number 14. Woodhenge Woodhenge is a Neolithic construction in present-day Wiltshire, England, that consisted of six concentric rings of timber dating to around 2500 BC. The mysterious site is located only two miles from Stonehenge. Due to the land being reworked over time, researchers are not exactly sure about what the site looked like, yet there still seems to be an agreement that the site was uncovered without a roof or ceiling. Towards the center of the circles is a cairn of flint, as well as a pit which contained the remains of a crouching three-year-old child with a split skull. And during the German Blitz in World War II, an explosion destroyed the remains of this child, so they are not able to be examined further, but the two theories around the cracked skull were either a part of a sacrifice or due to the weight of the dirt on the body. There seems to be some sort of connection between Stonehenge and Woodhenge, and was originally thought to be a prototype for Stonehenge, but after further research revealed that Stonehenge was constructed about five centuries earlier. Though Woodhenge still seems to point to the summer and winter solstice just as Stonehenge does. Another theory suggests it was used for ceremonial purposes or a place of offering due to discoveries of pottery items, animal bones, deer antlers, picks, and flint tools all placed around the bases of these posts. 
1966, another circle, now called the Southern Circle, was found 230 feet north of Woodhenge. We still don't know much about Woodhenge in particular, but I do think it's really intriguing how close these Woodhenge, Stonehenge, and the Southern Circle are to each other. Number 15, the Anunnaki. So the Anunnaki are a group of deities or gods that are found in a couple of ancient Middle Eastern civilizations, most notably the Sumerians, um, as well as the Akkadians, Assyrians, and the Babylonians. Now keep in mind that the Sumerians are the oldest known civilization in our recorded history, roughly starting around 4500 BC. Now, 14 clay tablets from the Sumerians detailed the stories of their gods, which are, like I said, the Anunnaki. Now, there's a lot of mystery that surrounds these mythical figures, but there's one wild theory that I thought I'd share. So the story goes that every 3600 years, their planet Nibiru, at the ends of our solar system, would orbit very close to Earth. Apparently, they couldn't produce enough gold on their home planet, and they needed gold in order to fulfill their needs, whether that be with advanced science or magic, who knows. They didn't have enough gold on their planet, so they sent ships to Earth where gold was relatively abundant. They arrived roughly 445,000 years ago and built a city called Eridu in Mesopotamia, and there was a garden within the city which was named Eden. Sound familiar? They used another alien race to have slaves extract gold, and they eventually went on to war because they rebelled against the Anunnaki, but the Anunnaki eventually won. They then wanted to create another race that was intelligent but also inferior so they would be good slaves. That's where the humans come in. The first successful human was Adamu, and there were many mishaps while doing this, creating the well-known Nephilim, for example. This can also explain why there seems to be a gap between the evolution of apes and humans, as the explanation provided by the tablet says that DNA from the Anunnaki was mixed with the ancient ancestors of humans. The Anunnaki taught humans agriculture and architecture, but eventually fell out of favor and were expelled from Eden and the city. It is said that their home planet came close to Earth again, and the gravitational pull caused the Earth to heat up and the glaciers melt, causing Noah's Flood, or the Epic of Gilgamesh Flood, or a worldwide flood in wiping many cities off the face of the Earth. Eridu and Eden were then submerged. The Anunnaki then left and instructed humans to construct temples that align with constellations, and also instructed them to keep a monarchical governmental system to keep the purest Anunnaki blood ruling over the others. So pretty much in summation, there's a group of people that believe that the Anunnaki were actually aliens that came to Earth, tampered with the genetics of humans, and created civilization, which is what we have today. They're known today as ancient astronaut theorists, and I think it's interesting to think about with all the similarities between all the ancient writings, but in reality, I think all these writings are just mythical figures made up to make sense of the world around them. I don't think that these were actually historical writings written in the time, and I think we kind of just have to take them how they are. Number 16, Hyperborea. Hyperboreans in Greek mythology were people who lived in the farthest north point of the world. Although Hyperborea was supposedly the farthest north point on land, they inhabited a sunny and temperate climate. It is also said that the sun only rose and fell once a year, which could possibly place the location of the Hyperborea somewhere in the Arctic Circle, but don't really know. The Hyperboreans were believed to live beyond the snowy Riffian Mountains, and other ancient writers believed the home of the Boreas or the Riffian Mountains were in a different location. The first person to talk about the Hyperboreans was Herodotus, so right off the bat we kind of have to question whether or not this was an actual place, or just a legend made up by Herodotus and told later in many different myths and legends. Throughout history there has been many different speculations on where Hyperborea was and whether it existed or not. Some speculations include they were north of the Alps or the Ural Mountains. Some speculate that it could have been the peoples located on Britain or it could have been the Vikings and Danish people because they seem to be the closest that match up to the descriptions that have been told through the legend. According to legend, the Hyperboreans were said to live in complete happiness and they said to have lived for a thousand years and were around 10 feet tall. They were white and also noted to have had fair hair. Personally, I think the most likely is that it was just a legend made up by Herodotus, but it could be true. It's obviously very hard to pinpoint the exact location, given that it's the farthest north point in the world and a sunny and temperate climate, so it doesn't exactly match up. But yeah, we'll just leave that one there. Number 17, Newgrange. Now, this is where it starts getting cool because these are some items that I've never really heard about, and so doing some research is pretty interesting. Newgrange is a Neolithic structure that's actually dated older to Stonehenge to 3200 BC in Ireland. 
It's a stone mound monument that's corridors align perfectly with the winter solstice and even portrays other astronomical events. It's said to be a burial ground for multiple people and the burned and unburned bones of graves or offerings are found in the middle circular chamber accessed through a long entrance hallway. There are also many other passages for light to enter and many incredible figures of architecture and art around and within the structure. In mythology, Newgrange is said to be a passageway or portal to another world, specifically the other world in Celtic mythology, which is just the realm of deities and possibly also the realm of the dead. Stuff like this always blows my mind because apparently it tells perfect time, and for ancient civilizations to have this type of power, or knowledge I should say, is very intriguing to me and I think that's the main mystery here. And just as a side note, I think a lot of people have all these mysterious ideas about ancient civilizations getting knowledge from some unknown source, but I really think we need to give credit where credit's due. A lot of ancient civilizations did have the knowledge and power to do such things, and I think it's a really cool idea. And I think it's fascinating that they were able to construct such structures that are still accessible to humans today. Number 18, Roman Dodecahedron. Usually made of bronze and sometimes even stone, these 12-sided objects have knobs at each corner and each face has a hole in the middle of them. There's a lot of mystery that surround these objects as over 100 of these objects have been found in areas that were once part of the Roman Empire. But researchers are still searching for the answers for their origins, function, and use. They have been found all over Europe from Wales, Hungary, Spain, Italy, but mostly in Germany and France, and they range in size between an inch and a half to four and a half inches, and believed to be dated between the second and third century. There are a wide variety of theories, although none are supported by any sort of proof, and these theories include leveling devices, astronomical calculations, religious artifacts, and even candlestick holders. Not much else is known about these devices, but I do think it would be pretty funny if they happened to be just kids' toys that babies could play with or even put wooden logs through different size holes instead of some impressive engineering marvel that everybody thinks that they are. Number 19, the Bent Pyramid of Sneferu. Sneferu was an old kingdom pharaoh who constructed the Bent Pyramid around 2600 BC and is one of the more unusual pyramids from ancient Egypt. The pyramid was built on the Nile's west bank and about 25 miles south of Cairo and was one of the first pyramids not to be built on fertile land. It's known as the Bent Pyramid due to the change in angle about 160 feet up the pyramid where it shifts from a 54 degree angle to a 43 degree angle as you can see here. It's notable because it's the only pyramid in Egypt out of the like 120 of them that has an altered slope. Two popular theories about why it's bent include reducing the slope after Sneferu heard about the collapse of a pyramid in Medum, 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 Medum. It's Medum. Two popular theories about why it's bent include reducing the slope after Sneferu heard about the collapse of a pyramid in Medum, or that due to the pyramid taking longer than expected, he lowered the angle to complete construction quicker. Many believe that there are still unseen or undiscovered rooms inside that might hold the real reason for the architecture and why the pyramid was built like that, but I tend to lead more towards architectural and structural design being the main reason for the bent shape. And finally, number 20, the mystery of the Pleiades across various civilizations. The Pleiades are a cluster of stars or a constellation that are recorded in many different ancient civilizations. The civilizations range from the Greeks, Scandinavians, various African tribes, the Aborigines of Australia, and even Native American tribes. All cultures illustrate the stars as being the seven sisters or the seven girls, and the story goes that all seven sisters are the daughters of the Titan Atlas or the equivalent depending on the culture, and in order to protect them from the hunter Orion, Zeus transformed them into stars. But the legend notes that one of the sisters fell in love with a mortal, and that's why only six of them are visible today. What's most interesting about this is that every culture that has this story has the constellations in the story with seven sisters instead of the six visible stars. Also notable, around 100,000 years ago, when humans were first believed to have been living in Africa, the seven stars in the constellations would have been easily visible. This in itself is pretty outstanding because the main theory of how all these cultures share the same story isn't from European migration or expansion. It suggests that everyone's ancient ancestors in Africa knew the story 
and as humans migrated around the globe, everyone kept the same tradition and oral history. There are also many different ancient artifacts all over the world which depict the seven stars, including what is believed to be artwork depicting the seven stars of the Pleiades in Gobleki Tepe. There is actually a big following of zodiac-like astrology groups that believe the Pleiades have a spiritual alien race that gives humans love and are more spirit-oriented than humans, but that's another story. The Pleiades are also mentioned multiple times in the Gospel account in the Bible. There seems to be an extreme spiritual connection between the star system and ancient and modern humans. Pretty fascinating. I think we'll have to do another video on this sometime in the future because there's a pretty wide range of theories about the Pleiades. Tier 4, even lesser known about. Number 1. Aindara's Footprints Aindara's temple is a site in Syria built by the Hittites, and it was built over 3,000 years ago in the Iron Age. The site was destroyed in a Turkish airstrike, so only rubble can be found there today, but the site notably featured a couple giant footprints. They were 3 feet long, which is obviously not human, and two of these footprints are roughly 30 feet apart, and oriented in a way as which whatever created them would have been walking in stride. Now this would show a rather large stride for whatever creature or creation these people made or communicated with. The giant would have had to have been around 65 feet tall to match our understanding of the dimensions of the human body. The site contained large carvings of lions and even a sphinx, which is pretty important. Historians have pointed out that the layouts of this temple closely resemble the layout of King Solomon's temple, suggesting that either temple may have been inspired by the other. So there are a wide range of theories about where these footprints came from or who created them. Some theories suggest that these were actual footprint indentions from giants, which we've talked about previously as the Nephilim who walked among men in biblical times. They could have also been created by the temple builders just to have been representative of the footprints of their gods. Or they could have just been carved out by the temple builders and there's no historical meaning at all, which I find a little bit unlikely, but it's still interesting is what is the unknown reason on why the builders would decide to make these giant feet. It suggests that they did experience something, or maybe they have stories of giants that had been passed down through the generations, like many ancient cultures showcase. And those depictions survived in their artwork and architecture. Number two, Dogu. Dogu are small humanoid and animal figurines that were created during the Joman period, which was between 14,000 and 400 BC in prehistoric Japan. And these dogu are only found exclusively within this period. The total number of dogu found vary among sources, but generally range between 15,000 and 18,000. They have been found all over Japan, mostly in the east, but what's interesting is that not a single one has been found on the island of Okinawa. There are a few different types of dogu found, mostly falling in the categories of heart-shaped, horned owl, goggled eye, and a pregnant woman type. Many scholars believe that these figurines acted as effigies of people, and they performed what is known as sympathetic magic with them, essentially acting as representations of a person the illness or any other misfortune would be passed from the person to the figurine. Some interesting pseudo-archaeological theories include the figurines being ornate representations of modern-day astronauts. Their helmets and goggles seem to resemble this, but this is another piece of evidence that modern-day ancient astronaut theorists use to support their claims. Although there are various theories ranging from sane to insane, nobody really knows why these figurines were made, and this still remains Japan's oldest mystery that is yet to be solved. Number 3. The Nebra Sky Disc The Nebra Sky Disc is a bronze disc of about 12 inches in diameter. It's blue-green and is inlaid with gold symbols that are interpreted generally as the sun or full moon, a lunar crescent, and stars which is interesting because there is a cluster of seven stars which can be interpreted as the Pleiades. Two golden arcs along the sides interpreted to mark the angle between the solstices were eventually added later. A final addition was another arc at the bottom with internal parallel lines which is usually interpreted as a solar boat with numerous oars. Though some authors have suggested that it may represent a rainbow or the aurora borealis. Aurora. The disc was found buried on the Middleburg Hill near Nebra in Germany and is dated by archaeologists to around 1800 to 1600 BC and attributed to the early Bronze Age Unidisc culture. The Nebra Sky Disc features the oldest concrete depiction of astronomical phenomena known from anywhere in the world. 
In June 2013, it was included in the UNESCO Memory of the World Register and termed one of the most important archaeological finds of the 20th century. There's a lot of controversy about whether the disc is authentic as it was found by looters, and there's a wide variety of interpretations about what it could actually mean. These interpretations range from calendars to symbolic value used in rituals among the people who created it. I personally think the depiction of the Pleiades is interesting, as we've talked about in previous videos, but I think that that could be the key to understanding what the true nature of this disc could be. Number four, Silphium. This was a plant used in classical antiquity for a variety of reasons and became so important to culture that it was worth its weight in gold. It was used in a number of different ways, from an aphrodisiac to medicine, which could actually be the first effective contraceptive used. It could also be used as seasoning for food, perfume, and a variety of other ways. It was believed to go extinct during the reign of Emperor Nero, having the last little bit of it after a final plant was discovered around 54 to 68 AD. It's a very interesting mystery as it was said to be practically everywhere around the ancient world, but Theophrastus, known as the father of botany, stated that it was unable to be farmed. He seemed to take great interest in the plant depicting all of its characteristics and uses. This, as well as some stylistic drawings of the plant, are all we have to figure out what this mysterious plant was. One major theory is that it was just over-harvested into extinction as it became so valuable. People often fed it to their flocks of sheep, which made their meat extremely tender, which is thought to be the leading cause of extinction. While doing some research about the plant, I have actually found some articles that were published only a day or two ago that all claim that the plant has been found in Turkey where ancient Greek civilizations would have been located. There's still some study going on around the plant that was found, but that could be an interesting development in the search. Number five, the stone spheres of Costa Rica. On the island of Isla del Caño and in the Dequis Delta in Costa Rica, there are over 300 stone petrosphere, which are attributed to the now extinct Dequis culture. Settlement of the region began between 1500 and 300 BC in the form of sedentary small and dispersed farming communities. Between the period of 300 BC and 800 AD, these settlements began developing into chieftain-like structures which ruled over different territorial regions in the area. They exchanged goods with each other, and this is the period where they began creating different sculpted stones, including cylinders, barrels, and even spheres that you can see. Then between the period of 800 and 1500 AD, this is when the culture reached its final height. These spheres were placed in very important areas within the settlements, and these spheres can range from just a few centimeters to over two meters in diameter. They were constructed by hammering the boulders into a crude spherical shape, and then with denser rocks and sand, they would polish the stone surface to make it a perfect sphere. After the arrival of the Spanish to the region in the 16th century, there was no mention of any Europeans seeing any of these stone spheres and they remained forgotten until they were rediscovered in the 1930s by the United Fruit Company while clearing the jungle to make way for banana plantations. It is interesting to see what these were used for and how these cultures could make such perfect spheres. Spheres like this are found all over the world in ancient cultures, so this could be evidence of an advanced civilization that was able to travel the world, or something just one-off like language or farming that could be developed independently across the globe. Number six, Tutankhamun's Iron Dagger. In 1922, Tutankhamun's tomb was discovered, and although there was evidence that it had been re-entered in ancient times, there was no looting that appeared to have taken place. Everything was in its intended place in accordance with burial practices of the time, and among the thousands of items within the tomb, there was one item that puzzled archaeologists, a small iron dagger. It may not seem like much, but to the Egyptians, the Iron Age was still 250 years in the future, well before King Tut would have been buried. It is believed King Tut died in 1323 BC, and the early evidence of Iron Age technology didn't emerge until around the year 1200 BC. And it's unlikely that the tomb would have been opened up hundreds of years later just to add a single iron dagger. After examinations of the dagger, it was discovered that it was made up of iron mixed with cobalt and nickel traces. What's interesting about this is that this combination of ore only occurs naturally in meteorites. So could the Egyptians have come across an extraterrestrial meteorite and then created a single iron dagger just for the pharaoh? Could be a possibility. I would like to note that iron working did exist, but since the material was so rare, 
it was worth more than gold and only used for small ornaments, trinkets, or for religious purposes, and wasn't even commonly used by royalty. So King Tut being in possession of this iron blade is a true mystery. Number seven, what were the Vimanas? Vimanas have many different meanings, but are primarily used for mystical flying aircraft, and they are mentioned in many different Sanskrit texts. They were said to be able to fly at great speeds, and they can even travel through space and underwater. They were primarily war machines or aircraft equipped with deadly weapons, but could just be used for normal transportation too. They can travel in any direction, and with the help of quote, quicksilver and great winds, they could fly vast distances and climb great heights. I've seen a couple of experiments about how mercury can produce a strong magnetic field and essentially cancel out gravity once it's spun at a certain rate. Honestly, I have no idea how the science of that works, but the demonstrations that I've seen are pretty wild. It's as simple as some guy in a field that moves mercury around with a magnet, and then the object can essentially float. Anyways, back to the story. In the Ramayana, the Pushpaka Vamana was a gigantic plane the size of a large city that could hold an unlimited amount of people. Essentially, imagine seeing a giant saucer carrying a city on top of it. The author of the epic also gave a bird's eye view description of India, which some scholars believe to be so detailed that it would have only been possible to describe the view from space. This detail in itself just begs the question of whether these actually existed or not. It's definitely interesting to think about. Number eight, the Baghdad battery. This is a collection of three artifacts that were found together a ceramic pot, a copper tube, and an iron rod. They were found in the capital of the Parthian and Sasanian empires in the Iraq, Iran, Persia area, and they date back to around 150 BC to 650 AD. Many think that they were just used for storage of sacred skulls, but there's no consensus on the origin or purpose of them. A claim, however, that's rejected universally by archaeologists, funny how this kind of thing always happens, claims that they may have been used for some type of galvanic or voltaic cell, essentially just a battery. Apparently, it has the properties of an electrochemical cell, and it could have generated electricity through spontaneous oxidation reduction. Not really sure or understand how this process truly works, so I'm not going to try to explain it, but this process would not have been discovered until the late 1700s and early 1800s, and was supposedly impossible at the time where these objects date back to. I wish I could explain more on how or why this process works so you could get a better understanding of the artifacts, but it really does make you think about what kind of civilization we had in our ancient past, and it makes you think of how much we don't know or don't realize how advanced they were or could have been. Number nine, Joseph Smith Papyri. Joseph Smith is the founder of the Latter-day Saints movement in the United States, and they are more commonly referred to as the Mormons. Now, I know he didn't live in the ancient world, but a lot of where he got his inspiration was, funny enough, ancient Egypt. Egyptian funerary papyrus fragments, known as the Joseph Smith papyri, still survive to this day. Originating from Thebes, Joseph Smith owned these, as well as four mummies, and according to Smith, these fragments held the records of Abraham and Joseph, two major patriarchs within the Bible. In 1842, he published what he claimed to be a translation of the Book of Abraham, he also claimed it held the Book of Joseph, but of course didn't release that translation. There are also some wild claims about the mummies being pharaohs, one of which being the pharaoh that ruled during the story of the Exodus. Although these claims are pretty big and, if true, would change the history of our past as well as even some biblical history, these are likely all ideas that were just fabrications by Joseph Smith to further his ideas. So this one did kind of stump me. I, I don't really think that this is a mystery other than Joseph Smith kind of making some stuff up. But I do think that this could go a little bit deeper. If anybody has any insider evidence that would support these claims, please let me know. I'm very interested in this. Number 10, the Olmec Colossal Heads. The Olmecs predated the Aztecs and Mayans in Central America around 1200 to 40 BC. They're the only known civilization that is dated to the Stone Age in the area, and we don't know much more about them except they had a big head fetish. 17 of these huge stone heads have been discovered, and the mystery here is primarily how did they make them, and how did they move the volcanic basalt blocks over 40 miles where they originated from in the Tuxla Sierra Mountains. 
It's reported that each head on average weighed about 40 tons, so moving something 40 tons over 40 miles would be a pretty difficult feat for a Stone Age civilization. Another great mystery is the facial features carved into these stone heads. Each head's facial features compares very similarly to the artwork of facial feature depictions that you would find in Africa, which should not have been possible because the contact between the New and Old World had not been done yet. It suggests that what we know or claim to know about early civilization and trade may be severely flawed because it seems fairly obvious that the Olmecs had contact with these people and could have even gotten their inspiration from their art. It's pretty agreed upon by Mesoamerican scholars that these stone heads were idols and were made to look like their leaders. So it could be interesting to see how the indigenous people of the region looked. It raises a ton of questions about ancient civilization and them possibly having a global network far earlier than what we would have thought possible or have been told possible by academia. But that's a whole nother story. Number 11, the Lost Labyrinth of Egypt. The Lost Labyrinth was built outside the Pyramid of Hawara and was one of the most visited sites in the ancient world. The labyrinth had over 3,000 rooms which were filled with hieroglyphs and other paintings on each wall. This structure is documented by our favorite and most reliable historian, Herodotus, as well as a few other ancient writers. It's believed that the structure held the keys to all of human history within the artwork that was depicted on each wall. Herodotus states that the labyrinth was situated a little above the Lake of Moiris and nearly opposite to that which is called the City of Crocodiles. When one had entered the sacred enclosure, one found a temple surrounded by columns, 42 each side, and this building had a roof made of a single stone, carved with panels and richly adorned with excellent paintings. It contained memorials of the homeland of each of the kings, as well as the temples and sacrifices carried out within it, all skillfully worked in paintings of the greatest beauty. What's interesting is that a structure this large and this visited was just lost to time and buried beneath the sands. It remained a legend just written about by Herodotus and other writers until the late 1800s when Flinders Petrie found the remains of a huge stone foundation buried four meters beneath the sand that was 300 meters wide. He claims that this was the remnants of the foundations for the labyrinth, with the structure itself being destroyed and quarried for different uses around Egypt. Other archaeologists uncovered some of the site, but it was immediately shut down by the Egyptian authorities. In 2008, new evidence was collected and began to challenge the conclusion of Petri that said that this was the foundation. This new evidence states that instead of the foundation, it was actually part of the ceiling or roof. Herodotus notes that there was one singular stone that took up the entire roof, and since they found a single piece of stone, you could point to the fact that this was the ceiling that other ancient historians claim to have seen. Along with that and the radar findings of tunnels and massive grid-like patterns underneath the stone, it looks like the Egyptian government is covering up the discovery and preventing the stories and mysteries of the labyrinth from the people. Which, there are also many theories on why the Egyptian authorities are covering up so many different sites, just like the tunnels under the Sphinx. And one of those is that the sites would reveal that the ancient or dynastic Egyptians were not the creators of them, or even the original inhabitants of the area. Maybe the Egyptian authorities are just protecting the historical significance of the ancient Egyptians, but we'll really never know the truth behind this labyrinth until the Egyptian authorities allow excavations to continue on the project. Number 12, the Tullenmand and other bog bodies. On May 6, 1950, Vigo and Emil Hodgard, along with Vigo's wife Greeth, were working in Bildsvodkal bog collecting peat when they uncovered a body of a man. All the man had on was a belt and cap made of skin, as well as a leather strap wrapped around his neck. What's wild about this is the man was buried, basically mummified, but preserved so well in the mud that it looks like he was a recent murder. This can happen once all the oxygen is taken away from the body. Y'all should look up the mass mammoth grave sites in North America, which date to the Younger Dryas event. But both these grave sites show similar features because of the lack of oxygen and very thick mud that can preserve animals or people for a long time. Anyways, they actually did an autopsy on him and his brain and other organs like his intestines which were all intact, which is a pretty wild for a body that old. And the Tullin man isn't the only bog body found. There are a lot of others found all over Northern Europe, being in Denmark, Germany, the Netherlands, England, and Ireland, with the oldest known body dating back to 2000 BC. Another detail that adds to the mystery is he seems to be smiling, but researchers believe he was ritually sacrificed or murdered, which would make you wonder why in fact he was smiling. They also haven't been able to pull any DNA from the body, so we don't know exactly where this man was from or lived either. 
This as well as the many other bog bodies found range in dating over thousands of years, which leaves the mystery of why these bodies were buried here. Ritual sacrifice, punishment, we may never know truly until we first learn more about the societies in which these people came from. 13. Mystery of the Varna Gold Between 1972 and 1991, 13 pounds of gold were excavated from a cemetery containing 312 graves in Varna, Bulgaria. These golden objects include bangles, pendants, discs, armor, and many other gold inlaid objects. These objects found in these graves date back to 6,500 years ago and has upended the long-held beliefs about prehistoric societies. Originally, the people of the Copper Age were thought to be small groups with a matriarchal structure, but this grave site tells a different story. The richest graves were male, the chiefs were male, and in general shows that this was in fact a male-dominated society. One in five of the 312 graves contained small gold objects and only four contained 75% of the total gold uncovered. Since they were only found in a handful of the graves, suggesting social status, which according to scientists would be the oldest known representation of this. Which this is in fact pretty ironic given the fact that the communist leadership promoted the site even though it was pretty evident that even in the 5th century BC, society was still stratified, which is the exact opposite of their ideology. People of the time were able to focus less on survival due to the abundance of food, and specialize in different areas such as metalworking, showing an advance in society. Then the true underlying mystery occurred. This all came to an abrupt end around 4000 BC. Settlements were abandoned, and there is not evidence of people to fill the gaps. Some scholars believe it was due to the invasion of Indo-Europeans, although no signs of battle or violence has ever been found. Another more recent theory is that, of course, it was the changing climate of the time which caused the villages to be swallowed up by the rising sea levels of the Black Sea. People are still searching for answers, but this gap in history is definitely an interesting one. Number 14, where did the Sumerians come from? We've already covered the Anunnaki and their connections with the Sumerians, but a more in-depth study of ancestral DNA and local legend has been researched by historians. The area of southern Mesopotamia has been inhabited since ancient times, and the present-day inhabitants, the Marsh Arabs, are considered the people with a direct tie to the Sumerians of the ancient world. In tradition, however, the Marsh Arabs are considered a foreign people with an unknown origin who arrived with the introduction of the water buffalo. But tests done with the mitochondrial DNA and Y chromosome indicate that we have records of people before the Sumerians. But there's no way to identify them because we have no artifacts or written languages as the Sumerians were the first, according to our knowledge, to develop such. But even though we find ancestors older than them, there's no statistically significant data that suggests that they weren't from the area. So we've got a little bit of a contradiction between legends and reality, but only a contradiction if we are underestimating how old the civilization really was. We only have records that we know of, and obviously that doesn't mean stuff existed before our discoveries. So if they are older than we think, then the legend may be true, we just don't have any evidence yet to support it. Number 15, the Karnak Stones. Outside the village of Karnak, France, there are roughly 4,000 prehistoric stones that are perfectly lined up in a series of fields. These stone lines stretch to almost a mile in length, and each individual stone can range from 1 to 4 meters in height, and can be dated between 4500 BC and 3300 BC. There are some pretty funny legends about these stones since little is known about their construction or purpose. Local lore believed that the stones to be that of a Roman army turned to stone by someone near and dear to my heart. Merlin the Wizard. Another legend is that this was an army of pagans that was turned to stone by Pope Cornelius. A lot of analysis has been done on astronomical alignments of the stones, how they align with sunsets, or even the solstices, but these are all heavily debated. One theory that I thought was pretty interesting was that if mapped out by connecting two stones to a bearing, they can point towards significant landmarks such as Edinburgh, Scotland, and Stonehenge, both of which were significant to the Celts. They also possibly point to other significant natural landmarks around the globe. If this theory is true, then it would show that the culture that created Stonehenge and Karnak were related, and that the world was traveled and mapped using geometry long before what is accepted by modern academia. Number 16, Kofun. Kofun are ancient Japanese burial sites for nobility, royalty, and emperors. There are over 160,000 of them, and they all have a distinct keyhole shape that isn't found anywhere else on earth. Some are even bigger land-wise than the pyramids of Egypt. It's believed that the site started as a circular mound surrounded by moats, but because that is difficult to maintain and observe, land bridges were constructed making the keyhole shape which became tradition. 
Japanese legend says that the emperor first came from the sky, as many other nations who have royalty who claim they have divine blood. They believe the royal family were descendants from the gods, and there's a theory that suggests that making the keyhole mounds or memorials was a way for the gods to find their blood, as they are only visible from high in the air. In 2016, there was actually a keyhole-shaped mound found on Mars, too. There's most likely not a connection here, but if the gods did come from another place, then you've got some pretty interesting stuff that you're looking at. Number 17, Rupkund. In 1942, an Indian official came across Rupkund Lake, which held between 300 and 800 human remains that were preserved by the freezing temperatures. Originally, the remains were thought to be from Japanese soldiers or Tibetan traders on the Silk Road who died from exposure to the elements. But after a study in 2004, it's theorized that this was a group of Indian pilgrims who could have been struck by a hailstorm due to the injuries on their skulls. A once-in-a-12-year Hindu pilgrimage to Hamkun, known as Nara Devi Yatra, could be the possible explanation of why so many people are at this site, as this lake is on the way to Hamkun. And since no weapons of any kind were found, they can reasonably conclude that they were not soldiers. This was the most widely accepted theory until 2019, where the results of a five-year study were published. They found that 38 of the skeletons belonged to three genetically distinct groups of people, and these groups of people were left here over multiple events over a 1,000-year period. The first group was South Asian, whose bones date to the 7th through 10th century, the second group was individuals from the island of Crete from the 19th century, and the last being the Southeast Asian origin, also in the 19th century. All of these findings were backed up by the dietary analysis done as well. Nobody really knows then why these groups of people were all at this remote lake and what their goal was. What I find so interesting about this story is that each time new evidence is found, it leaves significantly more questions than answers. Number 18, the Sivatherium of Kish. So a Sivatherium is an extinct genus of primordial giraffe that roamed Africa and the Indian subcontinent. It's believed to come about 7 million years ago in the late Miocene, and then most likely became extinct around 1 million years ago in the early Pleistocene. In the mid-1920s, a copper rain ring used to fit on the tongue of a chariot was found while excavating Kish, which was an ancient Sumerian city-state in Mesopotamia. It's dated to about 3500 BC, and while rain rings are a typical find for the time period, what's odd is the animal that's depicted. Usually the rings depict an animal that was used to draw the chariot, but this animal had horns crafted in a very unique way. Originally thought to be a stag Persian fallow deer, after closer examinations, the proportions don't line up, and the horns above the eyes are not known to be on the deer. Its proportions, as well as the horn structures, do however line up with reconstructions of the Civitherium, but how would this animal be around in 3500 BC when it was thought to go extinct roughly 1 million years ago? All of the rain rings that have been found previously have pretty good representations of the animals that they're depicting, so could this be an accurate depiction of a Civitherium who survived a lot longer than previously thought, or is this just an inaccurate depiction of a fallow deer? Number 19, what's actually inside Chin Shua Huang's tomb? On September 10th, 210 BC, Qin Shuo Hong died after conquering six warring states to create the first unified China and was buried in a tomb that is still unopened today. This was the most complex tomb structure ever created in China and is a massive collection of underground caverns that held everything the emperor would need in the afterlife. Ancient writings say that it was an entire underground kingdom with a ceiling that looked like the night sky with pearls used as stars. It's also thought that the tomb is surrounded by moats of liquid mercury, which they thought would bring immortality. Which is also kind of funny because he took mercury pills so he could live longer, when in reality this is probably what killed him. Some of the surrounding areas of the tomb have been uncovered, which house the well-known terracotta army, with estimates that there could be up to a total of 8,000 soldiers. When the terracotta soldiers were originally found, their paint would wear off almost immediately when exposed to the open air. They now have techniques that will allow them to preserve the paint on these terracotta soldiers. But this is a perfect example of one of the reasons why they haven't yet opened up the tomb. They claim they want to wait to open the tomb and excavate the rest of the area until they have sufficient excavation techniques that would allow them to do the least amount of damage. Unfortunately, due to the mercury as well as the Chinese government, the site remains protected and there haven't been any excavations on the main tomb. So there's no telling what actually lies within this tomb. And number 20, what was the set animal? Within the ancient Egyptian pantheon, there are many gods that are portrayed to have the heads of animals. And all but one can be identified as a real animal. This mystery animal is known as the Set Animal. 
Set is known to be the god of storms, disorder, deserts, violence, and chaos, and since the animals that depicted each god was used to represent their personality, we can assume that the set animal was not a very friendly animal. A lot of Egyptologists claim that this was just an imaginary animal, but many people have tried to give evidence that the animal did in fact exist. Many times it's depicted as a canine-like body with a long downward curved nose, square ears, and an erect tail. When it's on the form of a human, the tail is still present, the ears are still present, and it still maintains that long downward curved nose. There have been many attempts to connect this animal to known species in the area like hyenas, jackals, wild dogs, but some theorize it could just be a combination of all the animals that were used to represent the god set. Or, just like the civitherium, it could just be yet another species that was lost to time that the ancients depicted within their artwork. Tier 5. Obscure to the general public. Number 1. Adam's Bridge. Adam's Bridge, also known as Rama's Bridge, is a chain of limestone shoals between Pamban Island off the southeastern coast of Tanil Dadu, India, and Manar Island off the western coast of Sri Lanka. Geological evidence suggests that this bridge is a former land connection between India and Sri Lanka. The Western world came to know of the bridge via the Book of Roads and Kingdoms, in which it is referred to as the Set Bandi, or the Bridge of the Sea. Some early Islamic sources refer to a mountain within Sri Lanka as Adam's Peak, which is the location Adam arrived at after being cast out of Eden. And these sources describe Adam crossing the bridge from Sri Lanka into India after his expulsion, leading to the name Adam's Bridge. The earliest known source to call it Adam's Bridge is around 1030 AD and is probably the first to describe the bridge in this manner. And in 1804, a British cartographer created the first map which calls this area by the name Adam's Bridge. In Hindu tradition, the Sanskrit epic the Ramayana says that the bridge was a god-made structure made by the Lord Rama to defeat the evil demon king Ravana. The evil king held Lord Rama's wife in the island fortress, and the island was unable to be attacked or defeated. Rama's monkeys, or ape-like creatures known as Varanas, helped him build the bridge and defeat the evil king. There is some controversy around this, though, as modern popular belief tie the location of Lanka in the Ramayana to the island of Sri Lanka, although many scholars believe that there is an explicit distinction between the two due to Sanskrit sources from the first millennium mentioning both as separate locations. These scholars that do believe there is a distinction put the location of the original Lanka in the eastern part of the present-day Madhya Pradesh. The bridge itself consists of 103 tiny reefs and sandbanks that remained passable at low tide until finally in 1480 a tropical storm destroyed portions of it that now make it impassable on land. In general, there is a large dispute between the Hindu belief, the Islamic belief, and the proposed geological explanations some of these geological explanations include the bridge being formed due to the accretion of sediment in the channel, leading to it being blocked over a long period of time, or that Sri Lanka was originally part of the Indian mainland, with it slowly being separated over time. But according to our knowledge of the seafloors and tectonic activity, we don't have conclusive scientific evidence about how the land bridge was originally formed. Professor S. M. Ramasamy has conducted tests that concluded that the bridge was formed 3,500 years ago by ocean currents. This would put the creation of the bridge during the era of the Ramayana story and has given some people proof of that legend. One piece of evidence that people point to who believe that this bridge is man-made is that layers of coral are placed upon loose sand, which does not occur naturally and for coral to be here would be quite unexpected. Obviously, I'm a big fan of myths and stories being explanations for things that people were unable to comprehend, but the controversy and mystery here definitely raises some questions about this famous bridge and doesn't point to one theory to be the most correct. Number 2. Laos's Plain of Jars The Plain of Jars is a megalithic landscape located within Laos that consists of thousands of giant stone jars arranged in clusters ranging from one jar to several hundred. These jars were put in place as early as 1240 BC to 660 BC. They range from 1 to 3 yards high and each weigh up to 14 tons, which is unbelievable. There are over 90 jar sites that have been identified and out of those 90 sites, only one jar at one site has been found to actually have been decorated. This jar depicts a frogman carved onto the base and connections to the frogman rock painting at Huashan, China have been drawn. 
Only a few of the jars have stone lids, which leads experts to believe that the bulk of the jars had lids, but were made of materials which were perishable. Stone discs have been found near the jars, which cover or mark a burial pit, but are significantly more rare than the jars themselves. The majority of the stones are limestone, and it is believed that the people who created them used iron chisels, although there is no conclusive evidence to support this. Regional differences in jar shape exist, and while some of this can be attributed to the rock type, a few variations seem to be unique to a few sites. Researchers believe these jars are associated with burial practices due to the discovery of human remains, burial goods, and ceramic all around the fields that hold jars. Another commonly accepted belief is that because these are fields found all over Southeast Asia, they may have had links to a trade route that stored water in the jars from the monsoon seasons to refuel the travelers and the merchants. It seems like every ancient civilization that I come across has a legend of giants, because local legends suggest that these were created by Kun Cheung, an ancient king of giants who lived in the Laos Highlands area. The legend says that after winning a long and arduous battle, he created the jars to brew enormous amounts of celebratory rice wine. Unfortunately, between May of 1964 and the summer of 1969, the plane of jars was included in the area that was heavily bombed by the U.S. Air Force, with many of the jars being destroyed, broken, or even displaced. For the sites that do remain, many efforts to clear the land of the unexploded cluster bombs have been made to make a small number of sites safe to visit. Finally, in 2019, the Plain of Jars was made a UNESCO World Heritage Site. This would definitely make a very weird and unique burial tradition, so I like to think that the Giants is a lot more fun of a theory, but there's way too much evidence to dismiss the burial site. Number 3. Polynesia's Sweet Potatoes When Captain Cook arrived in Polynesia in the 18th century, the sweet potato was already widespread and a staple within the region. This fact began to support the theory that Polynesian voyagers had made contact with South Americans and brought the sweet potato back to be cultivated in their homelands. And with some other archaeological and DNA evidence, this theory of pre-Columbian contact between the two cultures seemed extremely plausible. But a new study was done suggesting that the split in DNA from both the Polynesian and South American sweet potato lineages happened over 100,000 years ago. This could suggest a couple of things. Humans must have not been responsible for this, according to mainstream thought of human history, and this means that the seeds were carried over the Pacific by birds, and they also discovered that the sweet potato seeds will still sprout if they've been exposed to seawater, which means they could have also floated to Polynesia. This also does raise some other questions. If it happened once, why didn't it happen again? Was there only one isolated subspecies 100,000 years ago? Maybe it suggests people were indeed responsible and that they did in fact live and trade over 100,000 years ago. There has been a lot of debate over that study of the sweet potato DNA, and many of the scientists claim that it was not handled correctly and would like to see it replicated in, in various other studies. I personally believe that there's a lot more evidence to support that the Polynesians and South Americans had made contact and traded. DNA from 107 people from 14 different Polynesian islands and Pacific coastal countries from Mexico to Chile were examined and it was discovered that people from four island sites in French Polynesia bore DNA indicative of interbreeding with South Americans most closely related to present-day indigenous Colombians at or around 1200 AD. This study left open the question of who traveled which direction but it is safe to point to the Polynesians with their well-known travels all over Oceania. It is pretty crazy that the sweet potato has shaped our understanding of human history and has raised many questions about the past 100,000 years on who made contact with who and what humans were actually able to achieve during this time span. Number 4. The Lost City of Dvaraka Dwarka is located 310 miles north of Mumbai, India on the western coast. This city is a busy port town and apparently it has been built on top of the ancient and mystical city of Devaraka. This is where the royal home of Lord Krishna and the gateway to heaven are. Dwarka is derived from the older name of Devaraka, which itself means gateway to heaven. And legend says that the present city is the seventh one on the original site, and actually still has an ancient temple on that site that is a major religious center and pilgrimage destination. According to Hindu texts, Lord Krishna, the 8th avatar of Vishnu, 
it is said to have built this great city and resided within. It is said that Krishna was born in Mathura in Uttar Pradesh, which is in the east at the foothills of the Himalayas. His uncle Kansa was known as a tyrannical ruler who was then overthrown and killed by Krishna. The father-in-law of Kansa swore vengeance on Krishna and attacked the city of Mathura 17 times, but did not succeed as the city held off each attack. Krishna realized that his people could not take much more from this, and thus left Mathura and founded the ancient city of Devaraka. It was in this city that Krishna would live the rest of his life and eventually die by accidentally being shot by an arrow while meditating under a tree. To create this city, Lord Krishna rose a huge swath of land from the seabed for the foundation of the city. The city was built with the help of Hindu gods and demigods. The god of the sea, Sumadradev, gave him 283 square miles of land out of the sea for the city. The city was believed to be full of sounds of the calling of cranes and swans, along with bees and birds. It was said to be a very peaceful place. And because this was a port city in ancient times too, the city was extremely wealthy. It's said to have had over 900,000 royal palaces. That's an incredible amount. They were all built with crystal, gold, silver, and even emeralds, and it's said that this was a place of paradise. Maybe it really was a gateway to heaven, maybe it was Eden. Also, according to legend, the city was destroyed by a massive flood, but even the ancient temple I mentioned earlier, only dated back to 2,500 years ago, that was destroyed in antiquity, and what stands now is from the 16th century. So we have to go back a little bit further. What's really interesting is that they found ruins and stones from a city that date back to 9,000 years ago to about 7,000 BC off the coast of the present-day city. This could mean that the original city of Devaraka could have in fact been a real place and yet another city destroyed by the rising sea levels after the end of the Ice Age. This would be yet another clue that ancient civilizations were in fact a lot more advanced during this time than previously thought, with examples of pillars, roads, and even foundations of buildings being excavated from under the sea. Number 5. The White Shaman Mural in southwest Texas, about a mile upstream for where the Picos Rivers empties into the Rio Grande, there is a small alcove within the limestone that houses some very interesting art. The 26-foot-long collection of pictographs is known as the White Shaman Rock Shelter. Although the pigments have faded over time, during certain parts of the day, notably at sunset, the light intensifies the colors of red and yellow, allowing for a clearer view and depiction of the figures. These figures range from abstract to even human and animal related figures. Although this is the most well-known site, it isn't the only one. Within a 90 mile radius, there are more than 200 rock shelters with various sized rock art which all fall under the branch of the Picos River style art. The people who created these works of art are thought to have lived between 2500 BC and 500 BC and lived as hunter gatherers in the area. The mystery here deals with what these pictographs actually represent. Originally, they were believed to be created by shamans in order to recreate hallucinogenic experiences, and more recently, an archaeologist by the name of Carolyn Boyd has put forth that they contain the history and belief of these ancient people. Through years of study, she realized that most of the Pico-style rock art is separated into three distinct tiers. She thinks they represent the underworld, the world itself, and the world above similar to the belief system and structure of the Mesoamericans, which isn't a surprise considering populations all over the world and throughout history have shared common belief structures and systems when coming in contact with one another. In the 1930s, at a site very close to White Shaman, archaeologists uncovered a mixture of peyote and other plants which were formed together to form discs. These discs could coincide with the discs found in the White Shaman artwork and this whole piece could be a way to represent how to correctly have a peyote ritual in order to communicate with the heavens. Obviously, it is extremely difficult and almost impossible to decipher what the culture was actually implying when making this rock art, but it is incredible the stuff that we've learned about this specific culture by studying these various rock style art. Number six, the tunnels at Baye. So these are a series of tunnels and caves in modern day Italy, just north of the Bay of Naples. The story says that a woman named Amalthea, who lurked in the caves, was so beautiful that she attracted the sun god Apollo. He offered her one wish in exchange for her virginity, and she wished for an endless life, 
but did not clarify that she wouldn't age, so she got really old but couldn't die. She continued living in the cave and eventually said that the cave itself concealed an entrance to the underworld. So what makes this story pretty fascinating is that the Temple of Jupiter was built on top of it, so it looks like it was somewhat similar to the Oracle of Delphi. And there were scrolls that were kept underneath the temple in case of times of crisis as essentially a manual that set out rituals that needed to be performed to avoid disasters. Apparently it worked pretty well until the temple was burnt down in 83 BC and the scrolls were finally destroyed completely in 405. The scrolls listed an oracle of the dead, and many believe that the caves at Baye were the entrance to that and to Hades. What's also pretty interesting is that two men who lived at a NATO airbase around the area, whose hobbies were excavating, sought out to find the real-life entrance to the underworld, or the Cave of Sibyl. They made it to this cave that went roughly 10 feet down in its first 400 feet of length, and notably they said the entrance was aligned with the summer solstice. Then the cave suddenly changes directions to a straight east-west, aligning with the equinoctial sunrise line. This suggests that it was a temple of some kind and served some ritual purpose. Paget and Jones noted in the deeper level of the caves that there were some spots spaced one yard apart on each wall, seemingly for oil-burning lamps, which also strengthens the idea that it was used ceremoniously and often. They then found at its deepest point an almost boiling stream that ran left to right across the tunnel floor of sulfurous water. They then went further and found a chamber that was oriented to the helical sunset. They believed that the tunnels and caves were constructed to mimic the idea of going into the underworld and crossing the river Styx, which led to Hades. The chamber that was supposed to mimic Hades also had a secret passage that could be traveled quicker than going along the river and through the s turn tunnels. So this may have just been a hoax by priests around 550 BC and onward, which this is estimated to be constructed at that era, to get people to believe that Hades actually existed. We're not quite sure whether the theory that it was supposed to represent Hades or the theory that they believed that it was Hades is truth. But another question does come up. How did these people know that there was a river of boiling sulfuric water under the hill? There's no steam and hot stream that arises from it. The stream, after being color dyed to test where it ends up, comes out into the ocean miles from the tunnels. It's really interesting thinking about how these people knew where the river was and knew to build a tunnel directly and perfectly into it. Now, it could also have been naturally occurring tunnels, but to have them line up perfectly is quite a coincidence. Number seven, the Herto Man. The Herto Man is the remains of a human found in modern day Ethiopia. The bones date back to about 160,000 years ago and were uncovered from the sedimentary deposits of the Buri Formation in 1997 by Tim White. This was a very significant find during the time since there was a massive gap in our knowledge of human history and the fossil record from 300,000 to around 100,000 years ago. Since he falls just on the edge of what we consider to be modern humans, they've named him as a Homo sapien idaltu, which means elder in the native Afar language. The skull holds a brain volume of 88 cubic inches compared to us at 92, suggesting that he and the others of the same species didn't have the brain capacity that we do today, but they were closer than many other older remains found from the Homo branch. Many think this could be the missing link between older Homo species and us, but this is not concrete truth though. In the original paper published by Tim White, they looked at the earliest remains found, which were from South Africa, and compared the bone structures and were able to come to the conclusion that the Idaltu is a separate subspecies of the Homo sapiens branch. Another paper published at the same time by Chris Stringer notes that this was the wrong conclusion drawn as he compared the bones to those found in Australasia, which dated back to the late Pleistocene. Tim White did consider this option, but more research done in 2011 and 2014 with much larger sample sizes shows how similar the skull shapes are for many remains found across the globe and puts the idea that the Herto man as a distinct subspecies under question. They've also found markings on the bones too, and due to how precise they are, this suggests burial rituals rather than cannibalism, which would be the oldest date if confirmed which, again, suggests that they were 
far more intelligent than we previously believed. And I know we keep going back to that humans are far more intelligent for a lot longer time than we think now, but I think a lot of evidence points that way. Also, as a side note, I do think it would be really interesting to live in a time period where there were multiple species of hominins all across the globe and to see what it was like to have these species come in contact with each other and how that played out. Number eight, the hanging coffins of China. So the hanging coffins of China are found all over southern and especially southwestern China towards the Himalayas. These are essentially coffins placed up on the side of cliffs or within caverns within the side of high cliffs. Nobody knows why these people used to bury the dead up on the sides of cliffs, and a lot of questions surround the how and why. For the how aspect, nobody knows if they were raised up to the sides of the cliff or if they were lowered down. Obviously, researchers now, when they go to study these graves, they will repel down, but obviously 3,000 years ago, when the oldest one can be dated back to, I don't think that they had the technology to be able to repel down with a coffin and place it in the side of a cliff, but who knows. As for the why, many assume that the bodies were put up on the side of cliffs to get the bodies away from animals who might try to scavenge them. But I highly doubt they would go through the effort of putting them hundreds of feet in the air for that reason instead of just burying them. Others think that the higher the bodies were buried, the more significant and important that ancestor or person was. Maybe they could get a jump start at heaven by being buried higher in the area. We just don't know. We don't know which tribe they were from, but we can estimate that they are at most 3,000 years old, and we don't have much evidence surrounding them other than the grave sites themselves. Locals apparently believe that these people used to be able to fly, which is how they explain how they got them up there. So maybe they came from a people who could fly, and they just didn't know how to anymore. Number nine, the land of Punt. Also known as God's Land, Punt is a faraway realm that was rich in incense, ebony, and gold. The Egyptians traded with them for over a thousand years. Hatshepsut and other pharaohs sent huge expeditions to Punt, and this is detailed in a book found in a 3,500-year-old temple near Thebes. And even though we have a lot of descriptions of many voyages, we have not found any records with a map or even any directions so we can find the land of Punt. So it looks like this is another ancient lost civilization comparable to that of El Dorado or even Atlantis. So the first mention of this mysterious rich place comes from the old Egyptian kingdom around 2500 BC during the reign of King Sihur. It's recorded that the expedition came back with 80,000 measures of what is believed to be myrrh or incense, 23,000 staves or wood, and 6,000 measures of electrum, which is a mix between gold and silver. Expeditions continued into the New Kingdom, with the last one being in the 12th century BC by Ramses III. What's really interesting, though, is that we have records of expeditions traveling south along the Nile and also starting along the Red Sea, suggesting that this place could be along the Nile and also expands eastward to the Indian Ocean, the African East Coast. It's actually suggested that they prefer the route of the Nile, but only if there were friendly nations along the upper Nile south of them. Obviously, there are arguments for the location to be in Africa and on the Arabian Peninsula. But the most interesting to be is considering a nation that controlled the mouth of the Red Sea and resided on both the Horn of Africa stretching to the upper Nile and also settled along the coast of Arabia. So the last Egyptian record we have of Punt is in the 12th century BC, which also happens to coincide with the Bronze Age collapse, which we've gone over in one of the first episodes of the iceberg. So could Punt have fallen to the Sea Peoples too? It looks relatively likely since we don't have many other records of them. Another interesting note is that the Queen of Sheba from the kingdom, or queendom, it's noted in Abrahamic religious text that Sheba had a line of 60 continuous queens, was built around 1000 BC and is also described of being from southern Arabia and Ethiopia. Could people of Sheba have been the descendants of the ruins of Punt, or could they be new people settled into the ruins of that region? Sheba was also said to be extremely rich and would trade gold and spices with Solomon. I'm not saying there's a connection, but I do see a ton of similarities between Punt and Sheba, the time frame, the descriptions, 
the proposed kingdom and occupied lands, but they could also be completely different or just made up entirely. And number 10, the Pyramids of Argolis. These pyramids in Greece have been dated to about 2800 to 2000 BC and are located by the city of Argos. This does provide proof of the mythology that the city of Argos did in fact have relations with the civilization in Egypt. There has been some controversy around what these pyramids date back to, and some say that it even coincides with the creation of the Egyptian pyramids. Obviously, throughout the ancient world, all over the world, you see buildings of pyramids, not necessarily in the same shape or style, but at least in the Mediterranean, they share the same shape, and they also share the same pantheon of gods. Obviously, they have different names, but the similarities are definitely true. This pyramid in particular is pretty small though, it is roughly 7 by 9 meters. There are many other theories, like one suggests it was a grave or a memorial site for soldiers who died on the field and that hill. Or it was sort of a furnace or chimney and was used to send smoke signals. And the idea that it was used as a post or observatory for land around the pyramid. But, like I mentioned, it's really interesting to see how all over Earth we find pyramids. It really suggests that human civilization was much more connected and intact than we generally think they were capable of. Number 11. The Ogdoad. The Ogdoad is a group of eight deities that were worshipped in the ancient Egyptian city of Hermopolis. The exact origins of the Ogdoad are unknown, but they were associated with the creation of the universe and the forces of chaos that existed before the world was created. The Ogdoad consisted of four pairs of deities, each pair representing a different aspect of the universe. The first pair, Nun and Nunet, represented the primordial waters of chaos. The second pair, He and Hauhet, represented infinity and the boundless expanse of the universe. The third pair, Kek and Kauket, represented darkness and the hidden forces of nature, and the fourth pair, Amun and Amunet, represented hiddenness and the unseen power of the universe. Together, the Ogdoad represented the chaos and uncertainty that existed before the world was created, as well as the forces that helped to shape and mold the world into its current form. The Ogdoad played an important role in the creation myth of ancient Egypt, which held that the world was created when the god Atum emerged from the waters of chaos and began to create the world. Despite their vast importance in the creation myth of ancient Egypt, the Ogdoad are somewhat of a mystery. Little is known about the origins of the group or how they were worshipped, and there is some debate among scholars about their exact role in the creation myth. Some believe that the Ogdoad played a more central role in the creation of the world than is generally believed, while others think that their role was more limited. It is also unclear exactly how the Ogdoad were replaced by the next pantheon of gods in ancient Egyptian mythology. As with many aspects of ancient Egyptian religion, there is some debate and uncertainty about the specifics of the transition from one group of gods to another, other than that there was a transition. One possibility is that the Ogdoad simply fell out of favor over time and were gradually replaced by a new group of deities who were more widely worshipped. This could have happened due to a variety of factors such as changes in religious beliefs or the rise of new political powers who favored different gods for many different reasons. Another possibility is that the Ogdoad were incorporated into the mythology of the next pantheon of gods, and became lesser deities within the new pantheon. This would mean that they were still worshipped to some extent, but had a lesser role in the overall religious beliefs of the ancient Egyptians. What's also likely is that the Ogdoad were simply absorbed into the mythology of the next pantheon of gods, and their individual identities were lost over time. This would mean that they were no longer worshipped as separate deities, but their attributes and characteristics were incorporated into the myths and stories of the new pantheon of gods. Overall, it is difficult to say exactly how the Ogdoad were replaced by the next pantheon of gods in ancient Egyptian mythology. The exact details of this transition are essentially lost to history and will likely remain a mystery. Number 12. What are ley lines? In 1921, an amateur archaeologist by the name of Alfred Watkins noticed that ancient sites all across the globe came into alignment with one another, forming what he called ley lines. Watkins proposed that these lines marked trade routes between ancient civilizations, but
but this theory was never accepted by British archaeological societies due to the clear fact that the most efficient way of traveling along these trade routes would not be in a straight line. Straight line travel among many of Watkins' proposed ley lines would involve scaling mountains or other difficult environmental challenges in which it would have been much easier to just go around. One of the most famous ley lines proposed by Watkins was one that connects the tip of Ireland to Israel in which seven different sites sit along it that all bear the name Michael within them. Over time, especially in the 1960s, this theory had developed into a supernatural belief system. The ley lines crisscross the entire globe, similar to how lines of latitude and longitude do, except the belief was that the ley lines mark ancient sites and carry supernatural energy along them. Where these lines intersect are said to hold vast amounts of spiritual energy that can be passed on and controlled by people. Some subgroups of ley line believers also say that these lines across the globe mark paths that prehistoric communities built to guide alien spacecraft. Other great monuments that sit along these ley lines are the Great Pyramids of Egypt, Chichen Itza in Mexico, and Stonehenge. Since these monuments seemingly defy the laws of architecture during the time period in which they were built, people have assigned supernatural powers to these lines and claim that the spiritual energy was what helped create such amazing structures. Personally, I never like theories that take away the credit of ancient civilizations and give it to some supernatural or extraterrestrial being, but that's just me. Obviously, this ley line theory has raised a quite a bit of skepticism since its inception, and researchers claim that these lines are pure coincidence. They point out that the lines can be any length and at any direction, which would not make them specific enough to form any kind of conclusive evidence. This was shown by archaeologist Richard Atkinson by demonstrating he could create ley lines out of anything since the rules were so broad. He connected a straight line of phone booths and argued that just because a set of points sit on a single line does not prove any significance over other points. As of today, the ley hunting community, as they were known, has officially been disbanded, but ley lines have bled into the modern pagan community in the Western world. Number 13. Who were the Guanches? In 1402, the Spanish Castilians conquered a group of islands known as the Canaries, which lie 62 miles west off the coast of Morocco. When they arrived to the islands, they found that they were inhabited by a group of people known as the Guanches. Since then, researchers have been trying to pinpoint exactly where this group of people originally come from and how they managed to get to and settle the islands. Theories range from places like Celtic or Viking ancestry all the way to these being the descendants of the lost city of Atlantis. In 2019, a DNA study on some of the mummies found on the island revealed that they were obviously most closely related to the Berbers of North Africa and arrived roughly around 100 AD. There are some interesting points about these people though. At first glance, the guanches seem to be primitive due to their lack of metalworking and tools, but on the islands there are a number of step pyramids. What was the need for building these pyramids, and how did they do it without proper tools to make it efficient? I had to dig a little deep to find some interesting theories about this, as it's not widely discussed. But there are a small group of people who think that the Berbers and Guanches could be the descendants of the Atlantean people. The theory that the Canary Islands were the location of the lost city of Atlantis is based on several factors. First, the island of Tenerife, the largest of the Canary Islands, has a volcanic peak called Mount Tede, which is the highest point in Spain. Some believe that the description of Atlantis in the writings of the ancient Greek philosopher Plato, who first mentioned the city, matches the location and characteristics of Tenerife and that volcanic peak. Second, the Guanches, the native inhabitants of the Canary Islands, were known to have a complex society with a system of government. They were also skilled farmers and fishermen, and some believe that these traits also match the characteristics of the people of Atlantis described by Plato. Third, the Guanches believed to be of North African Berber origin, and some have suggested that this connection to Africa further supports the idea that the Canary Islands were the location of Atlantis. This is because of all the theories floating around of Atlantis being in West Africa, as well as them also being connected during the Ice Age. Fourth, the ancient Egyptian historian Diodorus Siculus wrote about a group of islands in the Atlantic Ocean called the Fortunate Isles, which some believe could be the Canary Islands. These islands, said to be inhabited by a virtuous and peaceful people, 
who lived in a state of prosperity and happiness. Despite these factors, the theory that the Canary Islands were the location of Atlantis is generally considered to be a myth. There is no concrete evidence to support the idea, and many experts believe that the lost city of Atlantis is a purely mythical place. The true location of Atlantis, obviously, if it even existed, remains a mystery. Number 14, the Sajama Lines. The Sajama Lines are a series of geometric shapes and lines etched into the ground in the Sajama National Park in western Bolivia. The lines are thought to be over 3,000 years old and were created by the pre-Columbian Aymaras people. They are made by removing the top layer of reddish-brown pebbles to reveal the white sand underneath, creating a stark contrast that can be seen from a distance. The lines include straight lines, triangles, rectangles, and circles, and range in length from a few meters to over a kilometer. The exact purpose of these Sajama lines is not known, but they are thought to have been used for ritual or ceremonial purposes. Some theories suggest that the lines were used to mark the movements of celestial bodies such as the sun and stars, while others suggest that they were used for agricultural or astronomical purposes. The lines are also believed to have spiritual significance for the Aymara people who continue to live in the region today. In addition to the mystery surrounding their function, the Sajama lines are also shrouded in mystery due to their location. The lines are located in the Sajama National Park, which is a remote and inhospitable region of western Bolivia. The park is located at an altitude of over 4,000 meters and is home to some of the highest peaks in the Andes Mountains. The harsh conditions of the region, combined with the fact that these lines were not widely known outside of the local Aymara people, have made it difficult for researchers to study and understand these lines. The Sajama lines are one of many examples of geoglyphs found around the world, including the famous Nazca lines in Peru. These lines, which were created by the ancient Nazca culture, are also thought to have had a ritual or ceremonial purpose, but just like the Sajama lines, their exact function remains a mystery. Like the Sajama lines, the Nazca lines were only brought to the attention of scholars in the early 20th century when they were first observed by aerial surveys. Today, both the Sajama lines and the Nazca lines are considered important examples of ancient engineering and are protected as cultural heritage sites. Number 15, the Iron Pillar of Delhi. The pillars of Delhi refer to several pillars that were constructed in the ancient city of Delhi, India, during the time of the Mughal Empire. These pillars were created as part of the city's architectural design and were intended to serve as both decorative and functional elements. The most famous of these pillars is the Iron Pillar, which is located in the Kuteb complex in Delhi. This pillar is obviously made of iron and is believed to have been constructed during the reign of Chandragupta II under the reign of the Gupta Empire from 375 to 413 CE. The pillar stands at a height of 7.21 meters and is inscribed with inscriptions in the Brahmi script. There are several mysteries surrounding the Iron Pillar of Delhi. One mystery is related to the origins of the pillar. While it is commonly believed that the pillar was constructed during the reign of Chandragupta II, there is no concrete evidence to support this theory. Some historians and archaeologists have proposed alternative theories, such as the suggestion that the pillar was originally placed in a Hindu temple and was later moved to its current location. Another mystery surrounding the iron pillar is its construction. The pillar is made of high-grade iron, which has not rusted or corroded despite being exposed to the elements for over 1,600 years. This is an impressive feat of ancient Indian metallurgy and has led some experts to speculate that the iron used to construct the pillar must have been treated in some way to make it resistant to corrosion. However, the exact method used to treat the iron remains a mystery. Finally, there is the mystery of the inscriptions on the pillar. The pillar is inscribed with inscriptions in the Brahmi script, which has led some experts to believe that the pillar may have originally been a votive offering to the Hindu god Vishnu. However, the exact meaning of the inscriptions remains unclear, and further study is needed to fully understand their significance. Despite the uncertainty surrounding the construction, the iron pillar is considered a marvel of ancient Indian metallurgy. The pillar is made of high-grade iron, which has not rusted or corroded. This is due to the presence of trace amounts of phosphorus and sulfur in the iron, which act as corrosion inhibitors. The iron pillar is not the only pillar in Delhi that has attracted the attention of historians and archaeologists. 
Another notable pillar is the Ashoka Pillar, which is located in the Red Fort Complex in Delhi. This pillar is made of sandstone and is inscribed with inscriptions in the Brahmi script as well. The Ashoka Pillar is believed to have been constructed by the Mauryan Emperor Ashoka, who ruled over India from 269 to 232 BC. The pillar is believed to have been part of a larger group of pillars that were constructed by Ashoka as part of his efforts to promote the principles of Buddhism throughout his kingdom. The pillar stands at a height of 7.2 meters and is topped with a lion capital, which is now the national emblem of India. Number 16. The Paracas Candelabra The Paracas Candelabra is a large geoglyph, or a large designer motif, created on the ground found in the Paracas Peninsula in Peru. The candelabra is a stylized figure resembling a candelabra and is visible from a great distance. It is located on a hill overlooking the Pacific Ocean and is believed to have been created by the Paracas people who lived in the area from around 800 BC to 100 AD. The Paracas people were a pre-Columbian civilization that inhabited the coastal regions of what is now Peru. They are known for their sophisticated textile production and for the development of a complex system of religious beliefs and practices. The candelabra is thought to have been created by the Paracas people as part of their religious practices. The design, which takes the form of a three-pronged fork, is etched a good two feet into the petrified sand of the hill and stretches almost 600 feet from tip to tip. Despite its name, the candelabra is not thought to actually represent a candelabra, Instead, there are a number of theories about its significance. One theory is that the geoglyph is meant to represent the trident of the Incan creator god, Viracocha, possibly as an offering for his favor. Another theory suggests that the symbol represents the local jimson weed, which has hallucinogenic effects and may have had a ritual significance, with a large design acting as a beacon to guide people while using the jimson weed. Still others, like myself, believe that the etching was simply a sign meant to guide sailors to the Paracas coast, as the candelabra is able to be visible from out in the Pacific Ocean. Number 17, the Great Serpent Mound. The Great Serpent Mound is a fascinating and mysterious prehistoric site located in Adams County, Ohio. The effigy mound, which was built by the indigenous people of North America, is 1,348 feet long and 3 feet high. It is shaped like a coiled serpent with a triangular head and is thought to have been built around 1070 AD. The Great Serpent Mound is located on a plateau above Brush Creek and it is the largest serpent effigy mound in the world. It is also the largest prehistoric earthwork in the United States. The mound was likely built using a combination of soils and other materials such as clay and rocks to create its distinctive shape. There are many theories about the meaning and purpose of the Great Serpent Mound some believe that the mound was built to honor a revered serpent deity, which was a common motif in many ancient cultures. In North America, the serpent was often associated with water, fertility, and the underworld, and it may have been seen as a powerful and sacred symbol. Other researchers think that the Great Serpent Mound may have been used as a ceremonial site for religious rituals and sacrifices. It is possible that the mound was used for various ceremonies and rituals throughout the years, and that it may have been an important gathering place for the local community. One interesting theory about the Great Serpent Mound is that it was built to align with the movements of the sun and moon. It is possible that the mound was used as a calendar to track the seasons, and that it may have been an important tool for the ancient peoples who lived in the area. The serpent shape may have been chosen because of the association with the movement of the sun, as a serpent is often depicted as coiled around the sun in ancient imagery. I'm sure you all have heard Graham Hancock's theory about the Great Serpent Mound. I do think it's pretty interesting. He states that the alignment of the Great Serpent Mound with the stars and the moon isn't quite as accurate as it should be. And if you rewind to the point in time where the Serpent Mound was in fact 100% accurate with the alignments, this would have put the people who built the mound during the time period of the Younger Dryas event which fits into his whole theory about ancient civilizations being a lot older and more sophisticated than previously believed. Number 18, the Screaming Mummy. The Screaming Mummy, also known as the Unknown Man E, is a famous Egyptian artifact that was discovered in 1886 by British archaeologist Edward R. Ayrton. It was found in the tomb of a high-ranking official named Amenhotep, who lived during the 18th dynasty of Egypt, which was 
1550 to 1292 BC. The mummy, which was wrapped in linen bandages and placed inside a wooden coffin, was in a state of excellent preservation, but its facial features were distorted, giving it the appearance of a person who was screaming. Ayrton and his team were initially puzzled by the mummy's strange facial expression, and they initially thought that it may have been a result of a medical condition or disease. However, further examination revealed that the mummy's internal organs were in good condition, leading some experts to suggest that the screaming expression may have been the result of a ritualistic burial practice in which the deceased mouth was purposely left open to allow the soul to escape. Another theory is that the screaming expression was the result of a curse. In ancient Egypt, it was believed that a person's soul could continue to haunt the living if their body was not properly prepared for the afterlife. As a result, mummies were often given elaborate burial rituals and inscribed with protective spells to prevent their spirits from returning to haunt the living. It is possible that the screaming mummy was the victim of a curse that caused its soul to become trapped inside its body, resulting in the distressed expression that we see today. Despite the many theories that have been proposed, the true cause of the screaming mummy's expression remains a mystery, although the leading explanation is that after death, the ligaments and muscles within the jaw will start to relax, which caused the expression that you see here. Number 19. What happened to the Anasazi? The Anasazi were a Native American culture that lived in the southwestern United States in what is now Arizona, New Mexico, Colorado, and Utah. They were skilled farmers and craftspeople and are known for their distinctive architectural style which included the construction of cliff dwellings and other structures made of stone. Some of the most well-known Anasazi sites include Mesa Verde in Colorado and Chaco Canyon in New Mexico. The Anasazi lived in the Four Corners region of the southwest for many centuries, but by the 1300s they began to abandon their settlements and move to other areas. This period of migration and relocation is known as the Anasazi Diaspora. It is not entirely clear why the Anasazi decided to leave their homeland, but some possible reasons include drought, famine, warfare with other Native American groups, and internal social and political unrest, or a combination of all of these. Drought is thought to have been a significant factor in the Anasazi's decision to leave their settlements. The southwest is an arid region, and the Anasazi relied on farming and irrigation to grow their crops. If there was a prolonged period of drought, it would have made it difficult for them to sustain their agricultural practices and support their community. Drought obviously leads to famine, which is another possible reason for the Anasazi's migration. If the Anasazi were unable to grow enough food to feed their communities because of drought or other factors, it would have put pressure on them to find other sources of food or to relocate to areas where they could sustain themselves. Warfare is also a potential factor of the Anasazi diaspora. The Anasazi lived in a volatile region where different Native American groups competed for resources and territory. If the Anasazi were involved in conflicts with other groups, it may have made them to decide to move to safer areas. In addition to these external factors, there may also have been some internal social and political issues that contributed to the Anasazi's decision to leave. For example, there may have been conflicts or tensions within the Anasazi communities that made it difficult for them to maintain their current way of life. Overall, it is most likely that it was a combination of these factors rather than one singular one that made the Anasazi's migration and relocation necessary. Obviously, the full story of what happened to the Anasazi is still being pieced together by historians, but it will be interesting to see if we ever learn what the main reason for them leaving is. And number 20, Kaberi. The Kaberi were a group of ancient deities associated with the island of Samothrace in the North Aegean Sea. They were considered to be some of the most powerful and important deities in the region, and their cult was widespread throughout the ancient Greek world. The Kaberi were thought to be Chthonic deities, or deities associated with the underworld, and they were often associated with the mysteries of the afterlife. The origins of the Kaberi are shrouded in mystery, and there is little concrete information about their mythology. Some scholars believe that they were originally a group of indigenous deities who were later synchronized to the Greek pantheon while others believed that they were imported to Greece from other parts of the ancient world. Regardless of their origins, the Kaberi were thought to be powerful deities who were capable of bringing fertility and abundance to the land. The cult of the Kaberi was centered on the island of Samothrace, 
where they were worshipped in a series of elaborate and secretive rites known as the Mysteries of the Kaberi. These mysteries were believed to give initiates special insights into the workings of the universe and the mysteries of the afterlife. The exact nature of these mysteries and insights are unknown, but they were considered to be some of the most important religious rites in the ancient Greek world. The Kaberi were typically depicted in art and literature as young, handsome men who were closely associated with the sea. They were often shown holding tridents and other symbols of their association with the underworld. In some depictions, they were accompanied by their mother, the goddess Demeter, who was thought to be the protector of the mysteries of the Kaberi. Despite their importance in the ancient Greek world, the cult of Kaberi gradually declined over time, and by the Roman period they were largely forgotten and their mysteries were no longer passed down or practiced. So there's no telling what those mysteries held and if they were actually truly important in the workings and understanding of the universe. And Tier 6, Esoteric Level of Knowledge Number 1, Adam's Calendar Adam's Calendar might be the oldest man-made structure in the world that we know of. Although the dating is highly disputed, some people believe that the stone structure known as the Stonehenge of Africa is over 300,000 years old. Others believe that it's only 400 years old and that the stones that weigh five and a half tons were put there to keep cattle in a circle. The man who discovered it had to make an emergency landing while flying and he crashed his plane into the side of a cliff, then discovering these huge stones in South Africa. It was called Adam's Calendar because the ancient megalithic site appears to track the cardinal directions, seasons, equinoxes, and solstices, and even some major constellations, and obviously because of the apparent extreme age of this site. It consists of an outer stone circle that's about 98 feet in diameter, and there are many complex patterns and astronomical alignments within it. There are many other stone circles and roads, as archaeologists claim, around this particular site too, meaning that it was part of an overall site and possibly even a town or city. The two main stones in the middle of the site do have carvings on them, but I really couldn't find any conclusions of what they are meant to be or what they represent. But they do note that the stones were not carved there, they were transported from somewhere else. Which, if that's the case, and this site is 300,000 years old, that raises some huge questions in our accepted historical timeline. And there are some interesting connections to Egypt too. Both civilizations had a fascination with the cosmos, specifically Orion's belt, and they also both knew of the equinoxes and solstices. Another really interesting find is that some people report that the stones and rock formations that make up the calendar resonate sound frequencies. And apparently these sound frequencies resonate in the form of a flower, which I have no idea personally what that looks like or how that would work. But if you know anything about sacred geometry, that detail might make you a little bit excited. Some other people, obviously similar to the people who believe in ley lines, think that this site might have conducted electricity. Obviously, there's no proof of that yet. And of course, it also draws to another connection of Egypt. Overall, regardless of any claims of electricity or sound frequencies, it's a really fascinating structure, and I really do hope that we see some more archaeology and research behind it. Number two, the Baigong Pipes. The Baigong Pyramid Pipes are a collection of massive iron pipes that have been dated to 150,000 years old in the Qinghai province of China. The pipes are found near a mysterious pyramid of Mount Baigong, in which the pipes are held within caves found inside the structure. They are also found on the shore and at the bottom of a nearby lake bed, and scientists believe that the iron pipes were used to transport water from the lake to the pyramid. According to history, settled humans have only occupied the area for 30,000 years. Before that, only nomads were in the region. But there are so many pipes, and they are so complex, that it's pretty much been ruled impossible that anyone outside of modern humans today could have built them. But, again, they date back to 150,000 years ago. The Chinese Academy of Social Sciences isn't even ruling the possibility of ancient aliens in their research of the sites. The most widely accepted theory is that they were part of a larger structure that was left over by a prehistoric human civilization that abandoned the site, and the technology used to create it has been lost to time. What's really interesting, too, is that the scientists can't exactly determine what combination of material the pipes were made out of. At least 8% of the material has not been identified, 
And there's another theory that it's basically calling these pipes super fossilized tree roots, but they are iron. So not sure the connection there, but I think we can doubt that conclusion. But yeah, this raises a ton of questions when thinking about how old the pyramid and these iron pipes are. Just like many other items on this list, it shows how advanced humans could have possibly been in the distant past. Number three, human-made ditches in the Amazon rainforest. So there are around 450 earthworks or geoglyphs that have been found recently in the Amazon rainforest. The ditches range in size from around 11 yards wide and around 4 yards deep in general, and the sites are roughly 100 to 300 yards across. As deforestation started in the 1980s, hundreds of these appear when you remove the trees from the landscape. Scientists claim that they are only 1 to 2,000 years old, being formed in the Amazonian formative period, where other Amazon societies were also creating landmarks and natural sites all over the rainforest. What's interesting, though, is that the archaeologists don't think that there were ancient village sites because there hasn't been a single piece of evidence found that suggests there was any cultural material associated with the sites. The most likely theory is that they were created for ceremonial purposes, like important annual events or societal events like births, marriages, and deaths. I will say that the perfect geometry of the sites somewhat supports this idea. But in general, we don't know where these people lived. We have no other evidence of civilization outside of these sites. But most of these sites were located 180 to 230 yards above sea level, away from any large rivers, lakes, or anything that would allow any civilization or small society to flourish in such a harsh environment. So generally, all we know is that these people built impressive structures within the rainforest without actually living there. So why would they do that? We just don't really know. And I do want to mention this one thing that I found that was really interesting. It's not on the iceberg, but essentially there are some theories out there that the entire Amazon was actually man-made. They think that the entire Amazon used to be the home of a massive civilization. People have flown over the rainforest with LIDAR or some sort of other radar technology and have been able to map out big portions of the rainforest floor. And a ton of structures that appear to also be man-made have been found. If you're interested in hearing more about this, I think it's a really interesting theory. So let me know in the comments if you want us to do a particular video about this. Number four, Rujum El Hari. Rujum El Hari is a megalithic monument located in the Golan Heights region of Israel. It is also known as the Stonehenge of the Levant. Ah, another Stonehenge. Obviously, this is due to the circular shape and the large number of standing stones that make up the structure. The monument is thought to have been built around the 3rd millennium BC by the ancient Semitic peoples who lived in the area. Rujum el Hari consists of a circular enclosure with a diameter of about 105 meters surrounded by four stone walls. The walls are made up of large, carefully carved stones that are arranged in a precise pattern. The walls are approximately a meter and a half high and are connected by stone gates. Inside the enclosure, there are several small circles made up of standing stones, as well as several burial mounds. The purpose of Rujum el Hari is not entirely clear, but it is thought to have been used for religious or ceremonial purposes. Some have suggested that it was a site for astronomical observations, while others believe that it was used for tribal gatherings or as a burial ground. Whatever its original purpose, Rujum el Hari is an impressive example of architectural and engineering skills of the ancient Semitic people. The monument was rediscovered in the early 20th century by a group of French archaeologists who were conducting surveys in the area. Since then, it has been the subject of several excavations and studies, which have helped to shed light on its history and significance. Despite its age, Rujum el Hari is still in remarkably good condition. The stones are well preserved and the overall structure of the monument remains intact. This is thanks in part to the dry and arid climate of the Golan Heights, which has helped to preserve the monument over the millennia. Rujum el Hari is now a protected archaeological site and is open to the public for visits and tours. It's an important part of the region's cultural heritage and is considered a valuable resource for understanding the history and culture of the ancient Semitic people. Just like all the other stone hinges of whatever place they're located in, there's not much more that we can really know about these unless we were to rewind time and go ask the people who created them. Number five, the structure under the Sea of Galilee. 
So there's a monumental stone structure that's 60,000 tons and cone-shaped at the bottom of the Sea of Galilee. The mound is made of basalt boulders and is about 32-ish feet high and 230 feet wide, which makes it roughly twice the diameter of Stonehenge. <sighs> Another Stonehenge reference. It was revealed in 2003 by a sonar survey of the lake, and it almost looks like a giant burial mound. Since the structure is shaped in a way that's not found in nature, researchers concluded that the structure is in fact man-made, and they are dating it to about 4,000 years old. The reason they date it to this is because of other megalithic sites around the area, which were all constructed during this time frame. The structure was likely built before the lake saw rising water levels, but either way, it's very impressive that the society was able to organize these stones and create this huge structure. Obviously, since it's underwater, it's very hard to study, and we don't exactly know why it was built yet, which leaves this structure still a mystery. Number six, the Tophet at Carthage. Ancient Carthage was a city in modern day Tunisia on the north coast of Africa that was founded more than two millennia ago. It was established by the Phoenicians, an ancient civilization of shipbuilders and traders from the eastern end of the Mediterranean. It reached its peak in the 4th century BC and was one of the largest cities in the world. As the center of the Carthaginian Empire, it was a major power in the ancient world. Carthage was a significant rival to Rome, and the two rival civilizations were at war for over a century before Rome's victory and the destruction of Carthage in 146 BC. One of the aspects of Carthaginian culture that was lost with the city's destruction was the Tophet. The Tophet was a sacred site located outside of the city where young children were buried. In recent years, the Tophet has become the subject of historical controversy, as evidence suggests that some of the children buried there were the result of child sacrifices. The word Tophet originates from the Hebrew Topheth, meaning an open area for sacrifice or a place of burning. They were prevalent in the Eastern Mediterranean in the early 8th century BC. The term is referenced in the Hebrew Bible as a religious ceremony performed in Jerusalem that involved passing a child through the fire. This is believed to refer to child sacrifice, which is condemned by the Bible. The Tophet found near the ruins of Carthage has shown no signs of adult graves, and many of the grave markers are dedicated to Baal and Tanit, the patron gods of Carthage. Roman sources also attest to child sacrifice among the Carthaginians centuries after the Jews. However, it is acknowledged that the Roman sources are biased when it comes to Carthage, which obviously was their long-term enemy. The Tophet of Carthage was excavated between 1930 and 1970, revealing the bodies of young infants buried in small vaults with beads, amulets, and even small animals. In later periods, sandstone markers were found buried above the original layer of graves, and these markers were covered with stucco-colored yellow, red, or blue. Above the graves, narrow limestone grave markers appear, inscribed and decorated with the gods Baal and Tanit. There are references to places of child sacrifices in Jewish and Christian writings. The Roman writer Diodorus Siculus described the sacrifice of upper-class children to the deity Baal in 310 BC which is often quoted as the main evidence for child sacrifice during this period. However, some of the descriptions made by writers, including those made in the 19th century, include metal fire pits in the shape of a god with grates that tipped infants into the fire. These descriptions may be a little out there and could skew the actual history of this. These sacrifices were said to be used to appease the deities or to ask for favors from the gods. This is supported by some of the inscriptions found in the Tophet. Some sources suggest that small animals replaced the infants as sacrifices in later years. However, in general, many historians argue that the evidence for child sacrifice is inconclusive, pointing out that the archaeological evidence is sparse and that the text may have been written with ulterior motives, such as Rome's hostile feelings towards Carthage throughout their wars. The textual evidence is only found in Roman sources, and while the biblical sources confirm the concept of the Tophet, they do not mention Carthage at all. So overall, pretty interesting concept, but it could be a case of where the victors write the history. 
Number seven, why did the Cucutini Trapilian culture burn down their houses? The Cucutini Trapilia culture was an ancient civilization that lived in present day Moldova and Romania around 5400 BC to 2700 BC. They are known for their sophisticated and well planned cities, which they burned down every 60 to 80 years to rebuild elsewhere. This mysterious practice has given rise to several questions, including why they burned their homes and what the purpose of this was. Lifestyle and livelihood of the Cucutani Trapilia people were primarily based on agriculture, with crops such as wheat, peas, legumes, and barley being the main harvest. They were also hunter-gatherers and had the skills to create pottery and textiles. Women were considered the head of the household and were believed to have had significant roles in the community. Men were involved in activities such as tool making, animal domestication, and hunting. They believed in a female deity known as the Great Goddess, and there is evidence that the central buildings in their settlements were sanctuaries dedicated to her. This has led to speculation that they might have been following an early form of monotheism. One of the most interesting aspects of their culture was their approach to building structures and settlements. Their multi-story buildings were constructed using wood and lined with ornamental paintings of white and red, with clay altars and benches within. These specific decorations were believed to offer protection to the inhabitants from evil spirits. However, like I said, every 60 to 80 years, they would burn down their cities and rebuild elsewhere. The reason for this is still unknown, and several theories have been proposed. Some believe that it might have been a religious practice, while others think it might have been due to a need for new fertile land or the desire to escape from harmful spirits. The process of building these cities required the use of stone axes and later copper tools to cut down trees for construction. The structures were well constructed and showed evidence of sophisticated planning, making them Europe's first cities built before the great civilizations of the ancient world. They faded into obscurity as their structures were made of wood, which did not survive the test of time. This makes it difficult for modern researchers to understand the full extent of their culture and why they chose to burn down their cities. In conclusion, the Cucutini Trapilia culture remains a mystery due to the lack of evidence of their existence and their practice of burning down their cities. However, the evidence that remains suggests that they were a sophisticated and advanced civilization with a unique approach to building and settling long before their time. Number eight, Atlantis of the Sands. There are many stories in history that describe a towering city in the Arabian desert, which has been named the Lost City of Aram, which there are many different names people have given it, but this was just one. Another name it was given was called the City of Pillars, and they were a wealthy and powerful civilization. They believe this city was located in the empty quarter, which is like 6,600,000 square kilometers of barren desert in between the nations of Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, and the UAE. What's pretty cool is that this desert area, being one of the most dry and sandy deserts on earth, even more intense than the Sahara, was actually full of animals and vegetation before the end of the last ice age 11,600 years ago. And from 8,000 to 4,400 BC, the Holocene climatic optimum made the area even more moist, but then the area became very dry and turned into what we know as it today, a desert. And apparently around 620 AD, the city met a catastrophic end and has been later buried beneath the sand of the desert. The Quran and other books mention that Aram was destroyed by an earthquake, although we don't know if the other sources were actually copying the Quran. Another story or theory says that the city was built over a massive limestone deposit in which a sinkhole destroyed a lot of the city and the people moved out. Eventually, the desert then covered the fallen city. Personally, I just find it so fascinating that there have been so many huge and grand cities that are just lost to time, even just on this iceberg, that we still cannot find today. Number 9. The Cannabis Burial Shroud in China Archaeologists have discovered a 2,500-year-old grave or burial site in China, with the body inside having the apparent features of a white man and also an extraordinary amount of cannabis stored with him. They determined the man was around 35 when he died, and 13 cannabis plants, which were all 3 feet long, were buried with the man. 
This is the first time an entire plant was found, meaning cannabis was probably freshly grown in the region, which changes what we've previously thought about this location along the Silk Road. They also mentioned that there wasn't enough part of the plant still intact that they could determine that THC wasn't the reason they buried the plants with the man. This also raises questions about the history of the drug and the plant itself, and its open and accepted use thousands of years ago. Obviously, we are aware of the many different uses for this plant, not just with the THC, but it is kind of odd that these plants were buried with this individual and not anywhere else within the region. And number 10, liquid mercury at Teotihuacan. So yeah, apparently they made the pyramids of Teotihuacan from Forza Horizon 5 in real life, so that's kind of cool. But anyways, under the pyramid of Quetzalcoatl, Archaeologists have discovered a new tunnel and a massive pool of mercury has been found at the end of the tunnel, almost like a lake of mercury. The walls of the chamber were also made of fool's gold, or powdered pyrite, which give the reflective qualities of mercury a sparkling look. Almost as an entrance into the underworld through the mercury lake or river, or they just wanted the room to look like the cosmos. It would be a pretty cool sight to see when it was built. Overall, we really don't know why they put it in there or how it got in there, but some theories include that this would be the first royal tomb that we have found in Teotihuacan, as other cultures and civilizations also have royalty and divinity associated with Mercury, notably the Egyptians and also the Chinese emperor of Qin Shi Huang, which we talked about earlier in this series. So there's a lot of mystery here. We don't know who this was for, what it was for, why it was made, the only thing we can really look at are the similarities to other ancient civilizations. Mercury seems to have some super special properties that ancient people all over the world, who, keep in mind, did not have contact with the Americas, valued. Number 11. St. Thomas Silver Coins in India According to the Christian Bible, after Judas betrayed Jesus by identifying him to the Roman authorities, he received 30 pieces of silver as payment. The Bible does not explicitly state what happened to the 30 pieces of silver after Judas received them. However, in the Gospel of Matthew, it is recorded that after Jesus was arrested and condemned to death, Judas felt remorse and returned the money to the chief priests and elders who had paid him. They refused to take it back and instead used it to purchase a field known as the potter's field to bury strangers in. In the Gospel of Acts, it is suggested that Judas himself used the money to purchase a field, and that he met a gruesome end in that same field. The exact fate of these silver coins is not specified in this account either. So, the main question here is what happened to those lost pieces of silver? There are a couple of different theories that explain what could have happened to these lost pieces of silver. As I mentioned earlier, the Gospel of Matthew states that the chief priests and elders used the money to purchase the field known as the potter's field. This theory is widely accepted by many scholars and historians. Some scholars speculate that the 30 pieces of silver may have been returned to the Roman treasury by the chief priests and elders, who were afraid that the money was tainted by its association with Jesus and Judas. However, there is no direct evidence to support this theory. Another theory is that the chief priests and elders may have distributed the 30 pieces of silver to the poor as a way of making amends for their role in Jesus' crucifixion. This theory is also not widely accepted as there's no direct evidence to support it. Some other scholars suggest that the 30 pieces of silver may have been used to fund the early Christian community, which was struggling to survive in the years following Jesus' death. This theory is based on the fact that the book of Acts describes the disciples as pooling their resources together to support themselves and their mission. Again, there is no direct evidence to support this theory. And finally, another theory is that the 30 pieces of silver were hidden or lost over time, and their whereabouts remain unknown. This theory cannot be entirely ruled out due to the amount of accounts of different people across the globe claiming to have these pieces of silver. Now the validity behind these accounts is the questionable aspect. One account tells of four of the pieces of silver being in India after St. Thomas traveled here to preach and establishing churches throughout the region. According to this account, the coins are said by locals to have the ability to heal people and have been passed down through generations, but still kept secret with fear of robbery or persecution, as throughout history many people have tried to come and steal the coins, 
as this is one of the only accounts of these coins still being around. Other than this account I found, not much else is known about the location of these silver pieces, and in general, it's just up for grabs whether or not these still exist or even existed at all. Number 12, the Griffin Warrior Tomb. The Griffin Warrior Tomb is a fascinating archaeological discovery made in 2015 in the area of Pylos in southwestern Greece. The tomb was found by an international team of archaeologists led by Jack Davis and Sharon Stocker from the University of Cincinnati during excavations of the Palace of Nestor, which was a Mycenaean palace complex. The tomb dates back to around 1500 BC during the Late Helladic period, and it is named after the unique artifacts found inside, including a bronze mirror with an ivory handle depicting a griffin. The tomb also contained jewelry made of gold, silver, and precious stones, as well as weapons including swords and daggers. The tomb was constructed using a combination of large stones and smaller pebbles, and it had a small entrance that led to a narrow corridor. The main chamber of the tomb was circular in shape with a diameter of about 4.5 meters. The walls of the tomb were covered in plaster, which had previously been painted with decorative motifs. The tomb contained the remains of a male individual who was between 30 and 35 years old at the time of his death. The individual was buried with a variety of grave goods, including jewelry, weapons, and various other items. One of the most striking artifacts found in the tomb was the aforementioned griffin mirror, thought to be one of the earliest depictions of a griffin in the art of the ancient world. In general, the variety and quality of the grave goods suggest that the individual buried in the tomb was a person of high status and importance, potentially a member of the ruling class at the Palace of Nestor, such as a prince or high-ranking official. Others speculate that the individual may have been a foreign dignitary or a merchant who traded with the Mycenaeans. The jewelry found in the tomb includes objects made with materials that were likely imported from other parts of the Mediterranean world, such as amber from the Baltic region, lapis lazuli from Afghanistan, and carnelian from the Arabian Peninsula. The presence of these objects suggests that the Mycenaeans had access to a wide range of trade networks and were actively engaged in long-distance commerce. The discovery of the tomb also sheds light on the artistic practices of the Mycenaean civilization. The decorative motifs painted on the walls of the tomb are similar to those found on other Mycenaean objects, such as pottery and frescoes. The discovery of the griffin mirror is particularly significant as it is one of the earliest known depictions of this mythical creature in the ancient art world. And what's most fascinating about this find is that it puts the Mycenaean trade network centuries older than what it was originally thought to have been. Number 13, the Holy Prepuce. The Holy Prepuce, or the foreskin of Jesus Christ, has been the subject of religious lore and speculation for centuries. There are various legends and theories about the history and whereabouts of this relic, but the truth behind these stories is obviously shrouded in uncertainty. According to Christian tradition, Jesus was circumcised eight days after his birth in accordance with Jewish law, and the foreskin was removed during the circumcision and was preserved. This relic was said to have been passed down through various hands over the centuries, and it has been the subject of veneration and pilgrimage for many people throughout history. The earliest known references to the Holy Prepuce date back to the 4th century when the church father, St. Jerome, wrote about it in his commentary on the Gospel of Matthew. He noted that the Holy Prepuce was kept in a golden reliquary in the Basilica of the Nativity in Bethlehem and that it was venerated by both Christians and Jews alike. Over the centuries, various churches and monasteries claimed to possess this holy prepuce, and it was often the subject of controversy and dispute. In the Middle Ages, the relic was said to have been held by various European rulers, including Charlemagne and Barbarossa. In the 16th century, the holy prepuce became the subject of renewed interest, and various churches and religious orders vied for possession of the relic. One of the most famous cases involved the town of Calcutta in Italy, where the Holy Prepuce was said to have been kept in a small church. However, the relic was stolen in 1983 and has never been recovered. 
Obviously, there's a lot of debate around this, so some general theories are as follows. One theory is that the Holy Prepuce was destroyed or lost during the various wars and conflicts that have taken place over the centuries. For example, some believe that the relic was destroyed during the sack of Rome in 1527 or lost during the turmoil of the Reformation. Some others speculate that the Holy Prepuce is still in the possession of the Catholic Church and may be kept in a secret location, possibly in the Vatican or in one of the many churches or monasteries associated with the relic. There are also some various claims over the years by individuals who say that they possess the Holy Prepuce, but none of these claims have ever been substantiated. It is possible that the relic is in the possession of a private collector or institution, but there is no evidence to support this theory. And then finally, some scholars and skeptics have suggested that the Holy Prepuce was a myth or legend that was created in the Middle Ages to promote religious devotion and pilgrimage. They argue that there is no historical or scientific evidence to support the existence of this relic. Number 14. Apollonius of Tyana Apollonius was a Greek philosopher and mystic who lived during the 1st century AD. He was born in Tyana, a city in Cappadocia, which is now part of modern-day Turkey. Apollonius is best known for his teachings on religion, philosophy, and the supernatural, as well as his supposed miraculous powers. Apollonius was a well-traveled individual who visited many parts of the ancient world, including India and Ethiopia. During his travels, he met with various sages, scholars, and religious leaders, and learned about different philosophies and religious beliefs. He was known for his ascetic lifestyle, living a simple life, and advocating for vegetarianism. Apollonius was also said to have had the ability to communicate with animals and heal the sick, as well as other supernatural powers. According to some accounts, he was able to predict the future and perform miracles such as raising the dead. As a philosopher, Apollonius believed in the importance of living a virtuous life and pursuing knowledge and wisdom. He rejected traditional religious practices and beliefs, and instead advocated for a more personal, mystical approach to spirituality. Apollonius also believed in the existence of an immortal soul and the importance of achieving spiritual enlightenment. His teachings were heavily influenced by the Pythagorean and Neoplatonic schools of philosophy. One of the most interesting aspects of Apollonius' life is his relationship to Christianity. He was a contemporary of Jesus, and some have suggested that he may have been an inspiration for some of the stories in the New Testament. However, there is no concrete evidence to support this claim, and the stories of Apollonius are often considered more legendary than historical. Some have even suggested that Apollonius was a rival to Jesus, or even a member of a secret religious society that opposed the early Christian church. It is worth noting that many of the stories about Apollonius are based on legendary and mythical accounts, rather than historical fact. The earliest surviving biography of Apollonius was written by Philostratus in the 3rd century AD, and is largely based on earlier sources and oral traditions. Some historians believe that Philostratus' account was intended to promote Apollonius as a rival to Jesus and a figure worthy of veneration. Others have argued that Apollonius was a real historical figure, but that many of the stories about him were exaggerated or just invented over time. Either way, he's still a fascinating individual with a crazy history. Number 15, Asherah. Asherah was one of the many gods and goddesses worshipped in the ancient Near East, particularly in Canaanite and Israelite cultures. She was a mother goddess who was often associated with fertility, childbirth, and the nurturing of life. She was also closely linked to the earth and the natural world, and was sometimes depicted as a tree or a pole. In the ancient Canaanite religion, Asherah was the consort of the god El, who was considered the father of all gods. In this context, Asherah was seen as a nurturing mother figure who supported and sustained the world. She was also associated with the sea and the underworld, and was believed to have power over both life and death. As the Israelites emerged as a distinct culture within the broader Canaanite world, their religion began to take shape, and they began to develop their own understanding of the gods and goddesses. 
In the Hebrew Bible, Asherah is mentioned as the consort of the god Baal and is sometimes described as a foreign god whose worship was condemned by the Israelites. The relationship between Asherah and ancient Israel is a topic of much debate among scholars. Some argue that she was a major goddess in Israelite religion, while others maintain that her worship was always on the fringes of society, or that she was simply a symbol of religious syncretism. One theory that has been proposed to explain the presence of Asherah in ancient Israelite religion is that she was adopted from the Canaanites, who worshipped her as a major deity. This theory suggests that the Israelites, as they emerged as a distinct culture, adopted and adapted the Canaanite gods and goddesses to fit their own religious beliefs and practices. Another theory is that Asherah was actually part of earlier Israelite religion and was worshipped alongside Yahweh as a co-equal deity. This theory is based in part on the many references to Asherah that appear in the Hebrew Bible, as well as on archaeological evidence that suggests that her worship was widespread in ancient Israel. One piece of evidence that has been used to support the idea that Asherah was an important goddess in ancient Israel is the discovery of inscriptions and artifacts that mention her name. For example, there are a few instances of inscriptions bearing Asherah within it, all inscribing the following, Yahweh and his Asherah. Additionally, a number of figurines and other artifacts depicting a female figure with raised arms, possibly representing Asherah, have been found at various archaeological sites throughout Israel. These artifacts suggest that the worship of Asherah was not limited to the fringes of society, but was widespread and deeply rooted in the Israelite culture. Despite the evidence that suggests that Asherah was an important goddess in ancient Israel, her worship was eventually suppressed by the Israelite religious establishment. The prophets of the Hebrew Bible frequently condemn the worship of foreign gods, including Asherah, and call for the destruction of idols and other objects associated with her worship. Number 16. Cromlech of Almendres the Cromlech of Almendres is an ancient megalithic site located in the region of Evora, Portugal. It consists of a circular arrangement of over 90 standing stones dating back to the Neolithic period, approximately 6,000 to 4,500 years ago. Despite the site's age, its purpose remains a mystery to this day. But here's what we do know. The Cromlech of Almendres is estimated to have been constructed around 6,000 years ago, and the stones were quarried from nearby areas and transported to the site. The megaliths were then erected in precise positions using techniques that are still not fully understood. Some of the stones were carved with geometric motifs such as circles, spirals, and zigzag lines. The Cromlech of Almendres covers an area of approximately 70 hectares, which is about 173 acres, and consists of several stone circles, menhirs, and cromlechs. The largest circle, Cromlech dos Almendres, measures approximately 70 meters in diameter and contains 95 standing stones arranged in an oval shape. The stones are not all the same size, with the largest standing over 13 feet tall, or roughly 4 meters. The purpose of the Cromlech of Almendres is not fully understood, but it is believed to have been a religious or ritualistic in function. One theory suggests that it was used as an astronomical observatory, as many of the stones are aligned with the sun and moon. Another theory suggests that it was used as a ritual center for fertility and agricultural rites, as the stones are also aligned with the solstices and equinoxes. The Cromlech of Almendres also contains several tombs and burial sites, which suggests that it was also used as a cemetery. Many of the burials were accompanied by offerings such as pottery, flint tools, and animal bones. The Cromlech was rediscovered in the 1960s and has since been restored and preserved. It was declared a national monument in 1974 and is protected by the Portuguese government. The Cromlech is also often compared to other megalithic sites in Europe, obviously such as Stonehenge in England and the Karnak Stones in France. While each site is unique in its own way, they all share similarities in terms of size, construction techniques, and alignment with the sun and moon, and these similarities suggest there have been shared Neolithic culture in Europe that may have had similar beliefs and practices in general. I glossed over a couple of the theories about its function, so let's dive more into those. One theory suggests that the Cromlech of Almendres was used as an astronomical observatory. 
The alignment of the stones with the sun and moon suggests that the Neolithic people who built it were interested in tracking the movements of the celestial bodies. Some archaeologists believe that the stones were used to mark the summer and winter solstices, as well as the spring and autumn equinoxes. However, this theory has been criticized by some who argue that these stones are not precise enough to be used for astronomical observations. Another theory suggests that the Cromlech of Almendrez was used as a religious or ritual center. The alignment of the stones with the sun and moon could have been part of a larger ritual cycle, which was used to mark the changing seasons and celebrate fertility and agricultural rites. The Cromlech may have been a gathering place for people from different communities to participate in religious or ritual activities. However, there is no evidence to suggest what specific religious or rituals or beliefs in general may have been associated with the site. The Cromlech of Almendrez also contains several tombs and burial sites, which suggest that it may have been used as a cemetery. Many of the burials were accompanied by offerings like pottery, flint tools, and animal bones, and the presence of these burials suggests that the site had spiritual significance for the Neolithic people who used it as a burial ground. However, it is unclear how the burials and the stones were related to one another and whether they were part of some religious or ritual tradition. Some archaeologists have suggested that the Cromlech of Almendrez was used as a social or political center. The size and layout of the site suggest that it was a place of importance for the Neolithic people who built it. The stones may have been used to mark the territory of different groups or to signify alliances or rivalries between communities. However, just like the other theories, there's little evidence to support this theory and remains speculative. With all the different theories about the function of this megalithic site, I think it's important to keep in mind that the Neolithic people could have possibly used this structure for many different purposes, and not just one singular purpose. So none of these theories could be correct, or all of them could be correct. I personally find it hard to believe the Neolithic people would build the structure for just one singular purpose, but that's just me. Number 17, Natakris. Natakris is a name that appears in ancient Egyptian texts, including the Turin King List, the Karnak King List, and the Abydos King List. These texts list Natakris as the last ruler of the 6th dynasty of Egypt, which lasted from approximately 2345 to 2181 BC. However, the existence and identity of Natakris are a matter of debate among historians and Egyptologists. Some scholars believe that Natakris may have been a real historical figure, while others suggest that she may have been a mythical or legendary queen, or perhaps a combination of several different queens who were conflated into one figure over time. The name Natakris is sometimes written as Netakerti Sipta in ancient Egyptian texts. The name Natakris is believed to be a Greek corruption of her original name. According to the legend of Natakris, she was a wise and just queen who succeeded her brother, King Papai II, who ruled over Egypt for a brief period of time. One of the most famous stories about Natakris involves her alleged construction of a massive underground chamber in which she invited her enemies to a banquet and then flooded the chamber, drowning all of her guests. However, there is no historical evidence to support this story, and it is almost certainly a myth or legend. The story of Natakris and the flooded chamber is sometimes attributed to a male pharaoh named Neferakari Kakai, who is believed to have ruled during the 5th dynasty of Egypt. It is possible that the story of the flooded chamber was originally associated with Neferakari and was later transferred to Natakris. Some ancient Greek writers, including Herodotus and Manetho, wrote about Natakris and her alleged underground chamber. However, their accounts are generally considered to be unreliable and are often dismissed as fanciful stories. The Turin King List, which lists the kings and queens of Egypt, included a Natakris who is said to have reigned for a period of 12 years. However, the list does not prove any further details about her reign or accomplishments. Some scholars believe that Natakris may have been a queen who ruled jointly with her husband or a female regent who ruled on behalf of a young male heir. It is possible that the name Natakris was used as a kind of honorific or title for a powerful queen or noblewoman. In recent years, archaeologists have discovered a tomb in the Saqqara necropolis in Egypt that is believed to belong to a queen named Kintkos III, who may have lived during the 5th dynasty of Egypt. Some researchers have suggested that Kintkos III could be a historical figure behind the legend of Natakris, although this theory remains controversial. 
Number 18, the Lost Roman Legion in Li Qian. The story of the Lost Roman Legion in Li Qian is a fascinating but controversial historical mystery that has captured the imagination of scholars and researchers for decades. The theory suggests that a group of Roman soldiers was captured by the Parthian Empire during the Battle of Carrhae in 53 BC and taken to the eastern edges of the empire where they were eventually settled in what is now modern-day China. One of the main pieces of evidence supporting the theory is the discovery of a small number of ancient Roman artifacts in the area. These include bronze coins, Roman swords, and armor fragments that have been dated to the 1st century BC. These artifacts were discovered in the 1950s by Chinese archaeologists who were conducting excavations in the region. While the discovery of these artifacts suggests the presence of Romans in the area, some historians have questioned their authenticity and provenance. Another piece of evidence supporting the theory is the physical characteristics of the local population. The people of Li Qian are said to have distinctive physical characteristics that include deep-set blue or green eyes, high-bridged nose, and fair skin. While these features could be the result of intermarriage with other groups over time, some researchers have suggested that they could be evidence of European ancestry. In addition to the Roman artifacts and physical features of the local population, there are other pieces of evidence that have been cited in support of the theory of the Lost Roman Legion. For example, some researchers have noted that the people of Lichian have cultural traditions and practices that bear similarities to those of the ancient Romans. These include the use of acupuncture, the practice of divination, and the belief in a god of war. There have also been linguistic studies that suggest a possible connection between the people of Lichian and the ancient Romans. One theory suggests that the name Lichian may be a corruption of the Roman name Legio, meaning legion in Latin, while others have noted similarities between certain words in the local language and Latin. There are a number of theories about how a Roman legion could have made its way to China. One of the most commonly cited theories is that the Romans were captured by the Parthian Empire during the Battle of Carrhae in 53 BC. The battle was fought between the Roman Republic and the Parthian Empire and resulted in a crushing defeat for the Romans. It is believed that a number of Roman soldiers were taken prisoner by the Parthians and it is possible that some of these prisoners were eventually taken to the eastern edges of the empire, which included parts of modern-day China. Another theory is that the Romans may have been mercenaries hired by the Chinese Han Dynasty to fight against the Xiongnu, a nomadic tribe that was threatening the borders of China. It is known that the Han Dynasty employed mercenaries from various parts of the world, including Central Asia and the Middle East. Some historians have suggested that the Romans may have been among these mercenaries and that they were eventually settled in the area that is now Li Qian. Another theory is that the Romans may have made their way to China through trade or cultural exchange. It is known that the ancient Romans were involved in extensive trade networks that extended throughout Europe, Asia, and Africa. It is possible that some Roman traders or diplomats may have made their way to China and established contact with the local population. Over time, these contacts could have led to the settlement of a small group of Romans in that region. Despite these theories, there are several issues that complicate the theory of the Lost Roman Legion. One of the main problems is the lack of concrete evidence. There are no Roman historical records that mention the existence of a Lost Legion, and no other archaeological evidence has been found to support this theory. Additionally, the physical distance between Rome and China would have made travel and communication very difficult, and it is unclear how a group of Romans would have been able to survive and integrate into a foreign society. Plus, the physical characteristics of the local population could be the result of a number of different factors, and there is no conclusive evidence that suggests they are of European origin. Some historians have suggested that the theory of the Lost Roman Legion in Lichian is a modern myth and has been perpetuated by popular culture. The story has been featured in a number of books, documentaries, and movies, which may have helped to fuel the interest in the theory. Obviously, without any further evidence, this theory remains a mystery. Number 19, the Siberian Ice Maiden. The Siberian Ice Maiden, also known as Princess Ukok, is an incredibly well-preserved mummy of a young woman who lived over 2,500 years ago 
in the Altai Mountains of Siberia in present-day Russia. The discovery of the Ice Maiden is considered one of the most significant archaeological finds of the 20th century. The discovery of the Ice Maiden has revealed many insights about the ancient culture of the Altai Mountains. The mummy was found in a wooden sarcophagus dressed in a richly decorated outfit made of felt, leather, and woven fabrics. Her head was adorned with a headdress made of gold leaf, and she was buried with an array of valuable artifacts, including bronze ornaments, a mirror, and a decorated ceremonial cup. The Ice Maiden is thought to have been a member of the ancient Pazyrek culture, which flourished in the Altai Mountains from the 5th to the 3rd centuries BC. The Pazyrek were a nomadic people who lived in the region and were known for their elaborate burials and use of horses in warfare. While the cause of the Ice Maiden's death is unknown, some researchers have suggested that she may have been a victim of a ritual sacrifice, as her burial included a number of sacrificial animals, including horses, cows, and sheep. Others theorize that she may have died from natural causes, as no visible signs of injury or illness were found on her body. The richness of the Ice Maiden's burial and the complexity of her outfit suggest that she was a high-status individual, possibly a priestess or a tribal leader. Her headdress in particular is thought to be a symbol of power and authority, as well as a representation of the sun and the moon. The discovery of the Siberian Ice Maiden has been controversial in some circles as the excavation of the burial site was seen as sacrilegious by some members of the Altai community. In addition, the use of the mummy for scientific research has been criticized by some who believe that the remains should be left undisturbed. And finally, number 20, the Yonaguni Monument. The Yonaguni Monument, also known as the Yonaguni Underwater Ruins, is a submerged rock formation located off the coast of Yonaguni the southernmost of the Ryukyu Islands in Japan. I definitely butchered that. The Yonaguni Monument is considered by some to be a possible example of a sunken civilization or lost city. The formation is roughly rectangular in shape and is made of various terraces, steps, and platforms. Some of these structures appear to have been cut and shaped by human hands, while others resemble natural formations. So let's dive into some of these theories. There's the natural formation theory. Some experts believe that the Yonaguni Monument is a natural formation that has been shaped by erosion and tectonic activity over millions of years. They argue that the flat surfaces and straight edges of the structure are the result of natural processes, such as the fracturing and folding of rocks. Then, obviously, my favorite, the man-made structure theory. This argues that the Yonaguni Monument is a man-made structure that was built by an ancient advanced civilization. They point to the various terraces, steps, and platforms that appear to have been cut and shaped by human hands, as well as the presence of what appear to be carvings and tool marks. Obviously, since this is so far underwater, it would have been before the rising sea levels and would put the date of this ancient civilization far past what we previously have thought who would have been capable of making such a structure. There is also the underwater ruins theory. Some proponents of the man-made structure theory suggest that the Yonaguni Monument is part of a larger network of underwater ruins located throughout the Pacific. They argue that these ruins are remnants of a lost civilization that predates known human history. And finally, the geological formation theory. This theory proposes that the Unaguni Monument is a natural geological formation that has since been altered by humans in recent history. According to this theory, the structure may have been used for fishing or religious purposes by the local population. Wow, and that wraps up the final tier of the Ancient Mysteries Iceberg. Thank you to everybody that's been watching. It's been a lot of fun getting to do this iceberg, and I really appreciate everybody watching these videos and commenting. There are some other Ancient Mysteries Icebergs that are out there that have completely different topics, so we might be covering those in the future. I think for now we're going to take a break from the icebergs and maybe get into some long-form essay videos about various topics that we find interesting. I think next on the list will be the Lost Years of Jesus. I find this a fascinating topic and have some pretty interesting theories regarding this. I just want to remind y'all about the Discord server that we have open. It's been a lot of fun getting to talk and get to know everybody. If you want to join the community, there will be a link down in the description and really hope to see you there. If you do want to support my channel, I do have a Patreon open, but what means the most to me is you watching and enjoying these videos. So I really do appreciate it. 
and we'll see you in the next video.